Okay, everybody can see the uh, the screen share at chapter 24? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so tonight, this chapter is a pretty quick chapter. So depending on how we feel um, after it's done, we might start OBGYN, you know, the childbirth, um, depending on how people feel. And then we won't have to be um, staying as late tomorrow night. So we'll see how, we, how we're doing at the end of it. Okay, so we're going to talk tonight about emergencies dealing with the blood, okay, um, diseases of the blood, and with the kidneys. That's what the renal uh, disease is. So I have to be honest with you, uh, as far as seeing patients with hematologic emergencies in the field, um, calling 911, I really haven't seen that too much. Um, could happen, but I really haven't seen it too, too much. And, and again, what we're learning tonight is probably, you know, one one hundredth of what there is to talk about as far as, you know, blood disorders and stuff like that. So more than likely, those patients are going to specialized hospitals, probably a Westchester or Columbia, you know, down the city, and they're not going to be going to local hospitals up here uh, for the treatment of these types of things. Okay, so just a, a quick review of some of the anatomy and physiology. All right, so we know the blood is the fluid portion of your cardiovascular system, and it has some sp specific functions that has some specific components, right? So as far as components, we have the, flu the fluid portion of the blood, which is called the plasma, and floating in the plasma are the different, what they call form formed elements, meaning they have shape to them, and those are the cells. So we know red blood cells um, carry oxygen and carbon dioxide, and that the oxygen is carried on the hemoglobin molecule of the red blood cells. Um, we mentioned when there was carbon monoxide poisoning, the issue is that for some reason, the hemoglobin likes carbon monoxide better than oxygen. So if there's carbon monoxide in your system, it will completely coat the hemoglobin molecule and leave no place for the oxygen to jump on board. And we know that the only way that oxygen can get into a cell would be if hemoglobin carries it in, right? The cell would not accept oxygen on its own. Hemoglobin kind of has to knock on the door and unlock it to let it into the cell. And that's the same thing with sugar that, you know, sugar needs insulin to let it into the cell with the exception of the brain cells, right? The brain cells will accept sugar without uh, insulin. Um, which is actually somebody asked today, you know, about something about diabetic ketoacidosis. But one of the interesting things about diabetic, keto diabetic ketoacidosis is yes, the sugar in the bloodstream is very high, okay, but the sugar in the cells is very low because there's no insulin to bring it in. But in the brain cells, it's fine. So early on in diabetic ketoacidosis, they have a normal mental status because the sugar can get into those brain cells with no problem, and it's it's actually a lot of sugar. So the brain is well nourished with sugar. It can't get into the rest of the cells. And what actually leads to the altered mental status in diabetic ketoacidosis is, is the dehydration that occurs as the body tries to rid itself of all that sugar. So it tries to urinate out all that sugar and sugar molecules attract water. So as it's getting rid of all that sugar, it's getting rid of a lot of water with it and they get dehydrated. And then the other issue is they get acidotic. So it's called diabetic ketoacidosis because there's an acido acidosis that develops in the blood. And we know that the blood has a certain what they call pH balance, a measurement of the acidity, um, you know, of the blood. And when it's what happens in diabetic ketoacidosis is because it thinks there's no sugar, even though there's plenty of sugar, the cells think there's no sugar because they're not getting it. It tells the body to try to make sugar. And one of the ways the body can make sugar is to break down fat because all fat is, is a storage form of sugar, right? If you eat too much, it stores it as fat. And um, what it does, is it reconverts that fat back into sugar. That process of reconverting that fat into sugar releases a lot of what they call ketones. Ketones are acids. So it's, that's why it's called diabetic ketoacidosis, the keto for the ketones. And um, the body becomes very acidotic. So the mental status is really the dehydration and that the, the pH balance of the body is thrown out of whack. So it's just, it's an interesting, um, interesting thing, you know, when somebody at least thought of that, like, why would they have an altered mental status? If the brain can use the sugar, why would they possibly have an altered mental status? So, you know, it's clearly somebody doing some thinking. Okay, besides the red blood cells, we know that we have the white blood cells, right, which help to fight infection. It's one of the, the substances in our body that helps to fight infection. And then we have the, pla um, sorry, the platelets, 
uh, which are part of your blood clotting system. You have two things, you have platelets and then a substance called fibrin, F-I-B-R-I-N, that um, helps to control bleeding, right? So those are the parts of the blood. And then what are the functions of the blood? Okay, so obviously blood clotting, right? If there's a wound is one function, the delivery of oxygen and removal of carbon dioxide, we said. Okay, and the removal or delivery of other waste products, okay, that the body generates and other nutrients, right? It should actually have besides waste products, there's other things that the cells need besides um, oxygen and sugar, right? We mainly talk about that, but they need other things. You know, they need the electrolytes, the potassium, the sodium, um, you know, the vitamins. So there's other things that your body needs to function and that all travels to the cells by the, um, by the bloodstream. Okay, so we said that it's made up some uh, solid components, red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and that it's suspended or floating in the plasma, which is the fluid portion of the blood. Plasma actually is, is fairly clear looking, maybe slightly a little yellowish looking. Um, when we see blood on the outside of our body, it's because the hemoglobin of the red blood cell, the iron part of it, is mixing with oxygen and turning red. So most of, like if you were able to see blood floating through a blood vessel, for the most part, it's uh, kind of clear to a slightly little yellowish um, color to it. So the term aggregation that you see up here, the first word, aggregation means platelets sticking together. And we already talked about this once before, if you remember, we said that when someone has a heart attack, right, the typical heart attack that's caused by, you know, a thrombos, a, um, a blockage developing in a coronary artery is caused because there's a rupture of the fat on the inside of the coronary artery. Now, if you never had fat on the inside of the coronary arteries, you would never have a heart attack. But because the way we eat, we have a lot of fat on the inside of our coronary arteries. Again, the body grows a cap over it to lock it in place. And sometimes that cap ruptures and the body thinks it's a wound. And we know that whenever there's a wound, it sends platelets. So when the platelets go there and start sticking on each other to seal off that wound, even though it's not really a wound, that's called aggregation, platelet aggregation. So that's a bad example of it. A good example of platelet aggregation would be if you have a cut, right? And it, um, it, start, it st tries to stop the bleeding. Um, the problem sometimes with cuts is if it's a high pressure cut, like an arterial bleed, they keep on getting washed away and they really don't do a good job in stopping the bleeding until a patient's lost a lot of blood and the pumping action of the bleed is not so uh, strong anymore. And then once the platelets start to um, clot off the wound, then that fibrin comes over and acts like a ropes, like a mesh that kind of holds it in place. And if you really ever like look carefully at a scab, you can almost see these little like yellow lines inside your scab and that's the fibrin that's kind of holding it in place. Okay, so clotting factors are different proteins that play a role in helping to control bleeding besides the platelets, like the fibrin and other things. They're produced in the liver, okay? Whenever there is a problem, they're released and they cause bleeding. Now, sometimes obviously that could malfunction and we could have clotting factors released when they shouldn't be released. And then we have the risk of blood clots. Okay, so that uh, that's always a theoretical concern, you know, as far as a, a malfunction of your clotting system and stuff like that, okay? And this clotting cascade is what I was just describing to you when I talked about what happens when there's a cut. You know, first platelets go, platelets start to stick together, aggregate, form a, um, a clot over it, and then the fibrin and the other clotting factors come in, kind of tie it down into place. So usually everything uh, works well. Okay, so coagulopathies are abnormal coagulation issues, okay? So, I mean, some of you may have heard issues like sometimes when a woman's pregnant, she'll lose her pregnancy because her blood becomes very, uh, very viscous, very thick, and she develops clots in the amniotic, um, not the amniotic, the umbilical cord. So there's different types of clotting problems. People that get um, DVTs, deep vein thrombosis in the legs, a lot of times are prone to that. Um, you know, so there's a lot of different things, like anything in the body, you could have issues with your ability to either clot or you clot too well. And um, there's risks with it. So if you, if you don't clot, then you bleed. And if you clot too well, you get clots and you can get pulmonary embolisms, heart attacks, strokes, any of the things that could be formed by, by clots. Okay. Now, what makes people more prone to, um, you know, well, I guess what's the two main emergencies we kind of talk about? So people who have liver disease, since liver, uh, since the liver is one of the things that um, produces clotting factors. So people who have liver disease, and what type of patients have liver disease? Does anybody have any idea what types of patients are prone to liver disease? So what do you think? So people who drink a lot, right? 
would could, could have um, what basically cirrhosis of the liver, where the liver gets hard and it's hard for the blood to get through it. Okay, people have disease called hepatitis because remember you're, the the medical term you know is HEPA, right? For anything for the liver is like HEPA. So hepatitis is a inflammation of your liver that's caused by a bacteria. I'm sorry, by a virus. Um, that you can get. There's different types of hepatitis, but the ones that affect the liver are hepatitis B and C. Okay. Um, now, if you're in healthcare, one of the things your agency has to make uh, available to you is to have a vaccine against hepatitis B. Um, and you can waive it, but they have to offer it to you. There is no vaccine against hepatitis C, and hepatitis A is not, and I want to say it's not dangerous, but there is a vaccine against it, but it's not a bloodborne thing. It's more people not washing their hands well, going to the bathroom and not washing their hands well and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, that's that's one of the other issues where people will get, um, you know, have problems with liver disease. Now, hemophilia is a different um, issue where they don't produce the clotting factors that they need, and they actually uh, keep them in a, almost looks like an IV bag in their uh, refrigerator. And that if they have a wound, they have to have an IV started and have it quickly infused into them. Um, so that's a different problem. That's a genetic problem where they don't actually produce um, clotting factors. So they could actually bleed to death from a small wound. Like they won't control their bleeding whatsoever. Um, in saying that, you know, I've never seen anyone with hemophilia. I'm, I know they're out there, but I've never had a patient who called this with any type of emergency uh, like that. I mean, obviously, we do people with liver disease. Um, liver disease from alcoholism is definitely down because drinking is down to that point, you know, where people would actually get problems. But, um, you know, you can uh, also see uh, liver disease from something called a fatty liver. And that's people who are overweight and eat poorly. And they develop they have a lot of fat in their liver. And that, they, that co uh, will cause them at some point to have liver disease. And, um, you know, uh, could be fatal liver disease by, you know, constantly being overweight and uh, having a very high fat diet. Okay, now anemia is basically a disease where there's not enough red blood cells. Okay, so this may be something that some of your wives may have, like, because in women, because they menstruate, they have their period once a month, they lose blood. So some women get anemic uh, fairly frequently because of that blood loss. It's also not uncommon after a woman gives birth, especially if there's excessive bleeding with the childbirth, for them to come a, become a little anemic. It's not usually to the point where they need blood transfusions or anything like that. They just need to um, recuperate and probably eat some foods that are high in iron, uh, leafy green vegetables, red meat, you know, steak and stuff like that will help them. Now, there's two types of anemia. Acute anemia is somebody from a bleed. Somebody has a, you know, a, a severe bleed. Uh, whether it be internal bleeding, external bleeding, and they've just lost red blood cells through the bleed. And that would be dealt with by transfusing them with blood. Okay. And they have what they call packed red blood cells, um, which is basically just, you know, really just an infusion of red blood cells into the patient. And then chronic anemia, okay, is more or less what we kind of um, will see in patients who just feel tired and weak and, you know, just not themselves. And again, in a woman, it could Sorry, just be... It could just be the side effect of being a woman, you know, that uh, that they have to menstruate and that they give birth and stuff like that. Um, so most of the times that could be managed with di diet. Uh, the problem is a lot a lot of times taking a lot of iron is constipating. So, you know, people don't like to take iron supplements and stuff like that. And they may not like a lot of the leafy green vegetables, you know, the spinaches and the broccolis and, and the kales and stuff like that. So... Um, but it can be managed, you know, with, uh, you know, at least it can be improved with diet. Um, a patient who feels weak and tired, say over a period of weeks, one of the things we always consider is, do they have a GI bleed? Is, is there a small ulcer in their stomach somewhere, their intestine, it's bleeding very slowly. They don't see any differences in their bowel movements, or at least they don't notice it. Okay. But yet they're losing blood, not real quick, but slowly. And it's dropping their their, uh, hemoglo their hemoglobin levels in their blood, and they're just getting tired and weak and stuff like that. And then any disease affecting any of the cancers that affect the, the bone marrow, your red blood cells are produced in your bone marrow, right? Just the center of your bone, of your lung bones. So any disease affecting that is going to um, make you have less red blood cells. Okay, so again, not so common. Like out of all of this, like I've never had a woman call me, you know, and, and say, I feel weak and tired, you know, woman of childbearing, I feel weak and tired 
um, and I think I'm anemic, do something for me. They're just, that's not something that happens. Um, you know, but you will definitely get some people who just can't explain why they feel so tired. Okay. And then to come to find out that they have a slow, you know, a slow GI bleed. So you have to question them more on, you know, stomach complaints, you know, you're sure you have any stomach pain, you know, what is your, what does your stool look like? Is it dark? Is it real dark? Um, you know, and, and, uh, any problems, you know, eating any problems, keeping it down and try to figure out if it's a, you know, if it's kind of that type of stuff. I mean, again, once they go to the hospital and they get blood work back and they can see they're anemic, then they have different things they rule out. And more than likely, they're going to get an endoscopy and a colonoscopy to see if they see any of that bleeding. Um, and then they'll know what the problem is. And again, a lot of times with ulcers, um, it's actually a bacteria, H. pylori, a bacteria that can be treated with antibiotics. So it's not like, you know, they're going to need surgery or anything like that. This is another blood emergency, uh, very common in African-Americans, but it can happen in people of Middle Eastern descent. So it probably could show up in Israelis, um, you know, and stuff, uh, I, I would think, you know, I don't know if they're just saying Middle Eastern mean Arab, but it is possible. But here, you know, what I've seen, this is more the African-American patient um, that could have this. And what happens is that instead of the red blood cell having a very distinctive, almost like a hockey puck type of shape, um, it comes in what's called a sickle cell. A sickle is um, a device years ago they used to use in, in farming where they swing it and they used to cut the grass. It had a blade at the end of it that was in this shape and they cut the wheat with it. Um, so that's why they call it a sickle cell. But because of this shape, what happens is it gets stuck. The blood gets stuck in the blood vessels and it doesn't travel through. So they have issues with clotting and also the cells themselves do not last very long. So they get anemia, okay, because of the shape of the uh, sickle cell. Did somebody have a question or something they were gonna say? Okay. Um, so these people, when they have sickle cell crisis, what happens is they, they, the blood clots up and it's very painful for them. Um, and they can get clots any place in their body or anything like that. Oh, a, a, a sickle is called a zikl. Okay, close. Sickle, sickle. Zikl. Zikl, okay. Zikl, uh-huh. Okay. Um, so, um, but anyway, so what, what basically happens is it's, it's kind of a, Unfortunately, it is a disease that can be managed, but a lot of these people don't really live um, like a full life because of it. You know, again, there's no cure for it, but there's basically treatments that they could offer to these patients. So some of the things that could happen is that obviously, you know, we've talked that the spleen cleans the blood, right? Gets rid of red blood cells and stuff like that. So it actually clots up the spleen and destroys it. Sickle cell pain crisis is where they get excruciating pains in their joints because the blood can't travel through because again of the shape of it and it kind of clots up. Acute chest syndrome is actually probably the worst thing that happens to them where basically they can develop blood clots anywhere in their chest, their lungs, their heart, any of the blood vessels and then have the associated emergencies. In other words, if they develop it in their lung, they have a pulmonary embolism and their heart, they have a heart attack. Prior prism, we talked about when we said that that is the definitive sign of a spinal cord injury with neurogenic shock in a male patient. That's where they get an erection and it doesn't go down, right? It's not an erection caused by, because the, they're stimulated, it's an erection because in a spinal cord injury, because there's massive vasodilation. Remember neurogenic shock or spinal shock is one of the distributive shocks that's caused by vasodilation. So there's no blood loss. It's just that all the blood vessels lose their tone so they don't stay tight, they relax. And you know the way a man gets an erection is by vasodilation. So. But in this situation, the prior prism is not caused by vasodilation. It's caused by clots, not letting the penis empty of blood, right? So it, it basically fills up. It's almost like you put a cork and the blood can't empty out of the penis, so it fills up. Obviously, you know, a stroke is a clot developing in the cerebral arteries in the brain, okay? Remember, both heart attacks and strokes can be caused by burst blood vessels, by aneurysms, but that's a small percentage of either one of them. Most of the times, it's caused by... Um, it's caused by um, clots that develop. Okay, and then jaundice is the color, uh, the yellow color that somebody takes when they have liver disease. You may have saw young children when they were first born uh, with, with jaundice. That's just because they have an immature liver um, and that usually corrects itself in a couple of days. But um, when they have, uh, when they have 
uh, chronic jointus, that means they have chronic liver disease, and it's a yellowish color. Just from an, a patient assessment standpoint, the first place that yellow shows up is not their skin, is the white of their eyes, the sclera of their eyeball is the first place you'll see it. And you'll actually see that days before you'll see it on the skin. Okay, so it says one in 12. That's, that, that's easy to identify in African-Americans. Maybe that's why. Yeah, well, yes, it's probably. Because usually easy. it's hard. It's hard. Yes, no, you're absolutely right. Um, so one in 12, so that's a pretty high number, right? One in 12 African-Americans has the trait, but that does not mean that they're going to actually have the problem, okay? So, um, they, you know, they can have the issue, but they don't actually develop any of the complications and stuff like that. So again, it is possible to live a normal life if you just have the trait, but if you have the complications is where they run into problems. Um, so there is, um, you know, there is treatment for them. Like a lot of times we put IVs in them and hydrate them really well, give them a lot of fluid because that helps to break up the clots that develop. We give them pain medicine. Um, they actually know what their treatments are because you know they deal with this on a regular basis. Um, and uh, sometimes they'll even have medications that they keep at home for you to administer to them, not on an EMT level, but on a paramedic level and stuff like that. Um, and, um, you know, most of the times they're not being managed at a community hospital level, more at, you know, a university level hospital, like again, like a Westchester or an Albany Med or a Hackensack or a Columbia or something like that. So they're probably going to want to go to the hospital that has the specialists. These are hematologists, you know, that manage these patients. Okay. So again, oxygen could be definitely indicated because if the clot is in their lung, they're going to have trouble breathing and stuff like that. Um, you know, other than that, on a BLS level, there's not much else you're going to do to uh, do for them. Really, the, probably the most appropriate thing would be transporting them to the appropriate hospital. So, you know, obviously, if they have signs and symptoms of a stroke, they need to go to the closest hospital that's a stroke center. But if not, they probably do need to go to their, you know, um, hospital that's treating them for their sickle cell um, problems and stuff. And they more than likely have a phone number of somebody on their management team, you know, on their, their, their health management team, that's probably available 24 seven that you could call and, you know, at least discuss what some possible things you could do for them. Again, on a BLS level is not much um, you can do. I mean, I had one, uh, one time and they basically said, you know, start an IV and just hydrate them. And that's all we did. It didn't help, but you know, they said that it's probably not going to make him pain free but it'll definitely in the long term, the quicker he's hydrated, the better it is for him. So we just dropped an IV in and hydrated him. Okay, so the renal system is your kidneys. Does anybody, I'm sorry, does anybody have any questions on the, the hematolo hematology aspect of it? I mean, again, it's not something we see, you know, all too often, I have to be honest with you. I mean, most people go through their whole, you know, careers and never see any patients with those. Okay, so renal disease is problems. Uh, okay. detected besides the patient is telling you that? I'm sorry? Is there any way what you can detect it besides what the patient is telling you? It? Which one, sickle cell? Yeah. So I would say it, the only thing I could think of if they don't know they have it already would be a younger African-American, typically male, but it can be female, all of a sudden complaining about like excruciating pain in their joints or, you know, uh, leading like signs and symptoms of like a, a clotting issue. Right. So people miss it. Like, so you get a, you get a, you know, I'm, again, I'm talking about a young patient. Um, you know, you get a young patient signs and symptoms of a stroke. People don't really think it's sickle cell. It's just, it's not that common, you know, so they don't really think of it. But one of the things it could be is that they developed a clot because they have sickle cell. Um, hold on one second. I guess somebody's at my front door. Hold on one second. My dog's barking. Somebody must at my front door. Call Sabra. Oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, they call. Okay, my son has a guest. Um, so, you know, that could be, and I bet you there's probably some old people, you know, older people who have strokes, um, have pulmonary embolisms, and if nobody's there to tell you that they have sickle cell, that probably sickle cell was the cause of it, you know? So there's, you know, again, one, you know, in 35 years, it's so it's not that, that common. 
there was a guy in Spring Valley for a while that had sickle cell. I, I haven't heard of him in a while. I don't know if he moved or passed away or something like that. But uh, it's not that that common, um, you know, to find patients and then to find patients that are in the crisis mode. Okay, so for the renal system, again, it's, it's basically a kidney disease. And we know that we have two kidneys, right? They're in your your retroperitoneal space of your abdomen, which is like your back, the back of your abdomen. Okay. Um, and they basically are the filtering system for your blood, right? So they, they play a role in, um, you know, one of the main roles in cleaning your blood, the liver helps a little bit too. So you have two kidneys and then you have the two kidneys, uh, as the blood goes through it and cleans them produces urine that travels in two tubes. Okay. Called urethras. Okay, to, to your to your urethra, which is basically, um, I'm sorry, they travel from your kidneys um, through these two urethras that go to your bladder, and then once your bladder is full, it goes out of a different tube called urethra that goes to your penis or to a woman to her vagina for for urinating out. So what do the, what do the kidneys do? So besides cleaning the blood, okay, removing waste products and stuff like that, they can um, retain fluid if you need to. So like if you're dehydrated, what's the one thing you notice that you don't urinate as much, okay? Um, so they can retain fluid or if you drink too, too much, they actually can excrete more fluid, okay? And then they play a role in our acid-base balance, okay? By holding on to um, the different hydrogen and, and uh, bicarbonate, the different things that help to control the acid-base balance of the body, okay? so very vital organs, okay? Um, we have two, we could live with one, um, but obviously two work better, so. And the interesting thing about kidneys is they could take what they call a lobe of your kidney, a part of your kidney, and reimplant it in someone else, and that lobe will grow into a full kidney, and then your kidney will actually repair itself and grow back into a full-size one. So that's a pretty interesting thing. So again, you have two kidneys. These yellow things on top are supposed to be your adrenal glands. Um, your adrenal glands sit on the top of your kidneys and they produce adrenaline, okay? So whenever there's a perceived emergency in, by the body, it secretes adrenaline, which goes right into the, um, the uh, renal arteries that go right to your aorta and go pretty much through your body almost instantaneously. So that's why when you're scared, you almost instantaneously feel your heart beating, right? Because it takes seconds for the adrenal glands to squirt out adrenaline and for it to get into your uh, your blood vessels and travel all to the different organs that they're going to act on. So these kidneys are filtering the blood that's going through it. Okay. And this is supposed to be your aorta, this large red blood vessel. And this is supposed to be your inferior vena cava, right? So in other words, the blood's coming down from the heart. Okay. And then being cleansed. Okay. And then after it goes back up, uh, from the kidneys back up by the inferior vena cava back up to the right side of the heart and then be circulated around again. The tubes, okay, that are going to bring the urine to the holding vessel. So you have two, two urethra right there, and they go into the um, bladder. Okay. So your bladder is kind of a um, um, couple inches below your belly button and um, you know, it's just a, a bag, really a bladder, just a, that fills with urine. When it fills, it stretches, okay? And there's a nerve that sends that information that the bladder is stretched up to the brain, okay? And then the brain processes that and knows that you need to urinate and it sends a message back down. So this would be the sensory nerve sending the signal back up to the brain telling you um, that the bladder is being stretched and that means that you need to urinate. And then another signal is sent down to the brain to another, to a motor nerve that allows you to open up the sphincter, the, um, the muscle band that keeps the urine up in the bladder until you're ready to go. And then it comes out your urethra and your urethra travels in a man all the way, it's a tube that travels all the way through your penis. And that's what you would urinate through. Okay, so when people get kidney stones, they're gonna have a problem with the stone. This is basically the, um, the minerals in the foods we eat, okay, causing a little stone to develop in here. And they're gonna feel that stone sliding down along here and grinding its way through. And it's very, very, very painful. Okay, um, so that's kind of what a kidney stone is. That's probably the most common uh, urinary tract call we get in men is kidney stones. Uh, women can get them also. 
but uh, that's probably the most common one that we get. Now, UTIs or urinary tract infections are where because this tube travels to the outside of the body, there's always a possibility that bacteria could enter the tube and travel back up and make it up, okay, up into the urinary tract. So where it is in the urinary tract, whether it's the lower part or the upper part, it it's doesn't matter, okay? But if it makes it all the way up into the kidneys, that's a different type of infection. That's more of a, you know, a kidney infection. So when they talk about a urinary tract infection, it's the actual tubes, okay? Um, and typically it's the lower tube that gets infected. It can move up into the bladder and cause infection, or it could actually travel up uh, further up, you know, into the uh, urethra tubes that bring it uh, back up to the, bring the infection back up to the kidney. Um, more common in women than men, and that's just a pro that's just a function of distance, which means that because a man's penis extends from his body, it's actually harder for the bacteria to travel into the body. Where a woman's obviously it doesn't have that extra couple of inches of distance, so it's just more common for uh, women to get uh, urinary tract infections than men. If somebody's catheterized, where they have a tube. You know, they have a medical problem and they have a tube into their urethra um, to empty their urine up into their bladder, then it doesn't matter if it's a man or a woman. Once that tube's in there, if there's not good cleanliness, either one of them can get a very serious infection. So if you ever go to somebody who has a urinary catheter, right, so they have a bag that they're urinating into, if that urine does not look like normal, you know, clear urine, it looks dark or smells funky or blood stained, it's probably there's some definite problem going on. Remember, never transport a, uh, a patient to the hospital with a full bag of urine because it's going to rupture and it's going to be a disaster in the back of the ambulance. So have the family, hold on a second, have the family um, empty out, or if you're in a nursing home, have them empty out the urine, but if you think it's a um, infection or a problem with the urine, if they have a clear specimen, a lot of times they'll, they'll have a, a, a clear specimen container, which is like a sterile container with a cap on it. It's kind of what you, when you gave a urine sample, um, you know, at the lab type of thing that you would have urinated into and it's got a cover. So they usually have those just in case they think there's an infection going on so they can get a clear sample. Um, put some urine in that and then close it and bring that to the hospital. This way it could be tested right away rather than having to wait for the patient to start filling the bag up again to get a urine sample. Okay, so most UTIs are bacterial, which means they can be treated with antibiotics. Um, the problem is that in some people, they have so many of them that they get resistance to the common antibiotics that are used for it. So typically what will happen is somebody comes in with a UTI, they'll start them on the more common antibiotics, then they'll send the urine out for uh, testing and see what kind of bacteria is growing in it. And they may have to actually call them up and say, you need to come back for a different antibiotic to be able uh, to treat it, okay? So most of the times it doesn't make it up past the bladder, but if it, if it does, then it gets up into the kidneys and that's that pyelonephritis. That's when they get an actual um, infection in the kidneys, which obviously is a little more um, serious. And that's when the UTI goes all the way back up the tubes all the way into the kidneys. Um, that's a pe person that's gonna look very sick, you know, have high fever, shakes and stuff like that. Um, the kidneys are the last place that the blood goes. Don't, no, don't think of, um, so like, that's kind of hard, like it's kind of hard to picture. So somebody asked, is the kidneys the last place the blood goes? So when the, when the blood leaves the aorta, right? And it, it kind of is heading north, right? It's heading up towards your head and then it arches and it comes back down. Um, it's, it's a complete loop. So there's no real last place that it's ever going. It's a loop and it's constantly traveling around. It's not like it's in a, a straight line stops and then comes back, right? So your vascular system is kind of a continuous loop. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't say it ever stops anywhere because if it stopped, it would clot. So it's just kind of a continuous loop. Um, but, you know, I mean, I guess you could say the further it is away from the heart, the longer it takes to get to it. So like your toes would probably take a lot longer for it to get to than your kidneys would. Um, but it's, you know, it's basically uh, like plumbers kind of understand the cardiovascular system. It's like the water in your house, you know, 
I mean, you know, if, if, if you had a pump continually circulating water, the water would continually circulate around the loop until you opened a faucet. So the faucet could be like a bleed. So in our body, everything continually travels around unless we, you know, lose some blood uh, from somewhere. Okay. And obviously blood, you know, your blood cells have a, uh, a useful life, right? They, blood cells don't last forever. They break down and are, are removed from our body, mostly by our spleen, and they're replaced by new blood cells. Um, so, you know, and the same thing like plasma, I mean, you know, plasma sometimes leaks out of blood vessels to nourish the tissue around it. If it senses the tissue is dry and then we produce more plasma. So, um, okay. So the reason, you know, I put the UTI in here, it is a, a fairly common call. Okay. For us to go on a little old person, typically a woman, and the family's just going to say they're just not themselves, right? Cause they usually call probably three or four days into it. And and they're going to say, you know, grandma is just not herself. She has no, and before she had energy, she used to help me with the cooking, you know, uh, talk to the kids, help them with their schoolwork. And now she basically is, seems a little confused, has no energy. And what's happening is that infection is developing into a sepsis, right? Into a, a blood infection, a body-wide infection. Um, so, you know, UTIs can be life-threatening um, in patients. Um, especially older patients, especially older patients who have a lot of other health problems. So just always have in the back of your mind. And sometimes they don't have any urinary complaints, right? I mean, first of all, old people don't complain as much, right? Um, part of the reason is their nerve endings start to break down so they don't feel as uncomfortable and stuff like that. And also when they start with the fever and, and the dehydration, they're not thinking as clearly because they're not perfusing as well. So they don't have to necessarily tell you it hurts when they urinate. It doesn't have, they don't have to tell you that, um, you know, they're urinating more frequently. Um, you know, most of the times it's fever, chills, confusion, and stuff like that um, is the main complaint. Now, there's nothing in the world we could do for somebody with urinary tract infection except take them to the hospital. It's not going to hurt them to put them on oxygen. It's probably not going to help them. But, um, you know, there's, there's not really, I mean, again, they need fluids and they need antibiotics. So in a BLS level, we're not doing either one of those. So there's not much that we could really do um, you know, for those patients. Okay, kidney stones are another issue. Okay, um, I've not had women with kidney stones, but it is possible to have uh, women with kidney stones. Most of the, I mean, in fact, I can't even think of a woman who's had kidney stones, but you know, it's not that they can't have it. Um, they're basically made of the different minerals. So calcium being the main one that we take into our body, okay? And, um, you know, when they're kidneys, there's no problem whatsoever, but when they break loose and they start to travel down those tubes, it becomes very, 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 very painful, okay? Now, the nausea and vomiting is a secondary to the pain. It's not any problem with their stomach. Now, when they say unilateral flank pain, so basically what they're saying was one-sided because it's one tube, right? One tube's involved, and it's usually off to the side because that's the way the tube runs through your body. Um, so it is pretty, pretty intense pain, um, hurts a lot, okay, as it's traveling. If it stops um, and gets stuck, it's the pain stops, but the problem is that this kidney is not gonna empty, right? If, so in other words, if you had a stone that blocked this kidney, this kidney is not gonna empty, and that becomes an emergency in itself. Um, so flank is just a term for the side. Somebody's asking what flank is. Flank is just a term for like your side of your, I guess, abdomen you know, the lateral side of your abdomen. Um, and what do they do? So most of the times it's uh, pain management and hydration. They'll put IVs in them and uh, give them a lot of fluid and try to float the, uh, by, you know, be giving them a lot of fluid, you increase the amount of urine that the uh, kidneys are gonna produce. And they try to actually flush it out of the system. If that doesn't work, then they actually try to break it up, break them up with a device that um, bounces sound waves off of them. So they put you in a in a tub of water, and they have this uh, device they put up against where they think the kidney. They could see where the kidney stone is, um, basically on a uh, not an X-ray. Um, I don't know if it's a CAT scan or a sonogram, probably a sonogram, an ultrasound type of thing. They can see where it is, and they bounce sound waves off of it and try to shatter it. Um, with it. So that in itself is a little bit of a painful treatment, but it's better than the alternative, which is surgery. Okay. So, um, and people can definitely be more prone to kidney stones. Um, they usually, if they start having repeated kidney stones, put them on a special diet 
where they tend to uh, produce um, less uh, kidney stones. You know, uric acid is one of the big, having too much uric acid is one of the big culprits of this. And that's also people who have gout are actually also a uric acid type of uh, problem. Okay. Um, patients with um, urinary catheters. So we said, you know, patients who have uh, problems urinating or problems um, where they need to collect the urine or something like that, you know, will have, will be catheterized where a tube will be inserted up their penis up into the tube and go all the way up into their bladder. And it will empty the urine straight from their bladder into the bag with no need for, for urination. Um, you know, so that's the, that's the short term. If they're going to need to be catheterized permanently, then it's actually a surgical procedure where they go in through the stomach right over the bladder and permanently suture a tube in there. Um, the biggest issues is infection, okay, with both of those. Um, you know, again, if there's an open wound, not an, I shouldn't call it an open wound, but if there's an incision on the abdomen, okay, there's always a risk of bacteria entering into that, even though it'll, you know, it'll close off and scar off at some point, there's always a risk of that. And then again, there's always just a risk, now that you have a tube, Okay, that if somebody who's handling, you know, the emptying of the bag may introduce bacteria or something like that, or even if the bag is not emptied on a regular basis, bacteria can develop in the urine, okay, and make its way back up the tube, up into the urethra, and to the bladder, and then, you know, possibly all the way up to the kidney. So people who are catheterized are always at a little more risk for that, okay. Now, the worst level of kidney disease is called renal failure, and these are patients whose their kidneys are shutting down. Now, renal failure can happen to anyone if you go into shock because the kidneys need a large amount of blood, okay, on a regular basis, and if they don't get that, they're not going to be perfused and they could start shutting down. It's actually the first organ in most patients that shuts down when they go into shock, um, and sometimes in a very aggressive settings, you know, hospitals and stuff like that, where they're aggressive, if a patient is borderline shocky, they're actually put them on dialysis, which is a machine that takes the role of the kidneys just to take the load off the kidneys. In other words, they don't need dialysis yet. Their kidneys are still working, but they'll prophylactically put them on those machines um, so they take the workload off the kidneys and then and, and the kidneys don't need to be as perfused as much and stuff like that. Um, but pe people that uh, develop what they call end-stage renal disease means their kidneys are no longer cleansing their blood, they're not producing urine, and they need to have dialysis, which is basically a machine that cleanses their blood for them. And if they don't have that, then they would die. Now, they don't have to be on the machine 24-7, um, okay, um, but they usually need to be on it every other day uh, for the rest of their lives to do it. And one of the you know common reasons why people have uh, end-stage renal disease is actually high blood pressure, untreated, undiagnosed high blood pressure. Because again, the danger of high blood pressure is that the all our organs are designed to have blood traveled through them with a certain pressure. And if that pressure is chronically high, it's going to eventually over 20, 30, 40 years damage the organ. The other thing that leads to renal disease is having untreated kidney problems, right? I mean, so having hepatitis and not treating it or drinking too much will all lead to uh, end-stage renal disease, which will lead to being on a, a dialysis machine for the rest of your life. Um, and that is not a good quality of life. You're basically sitting in a chair or a recliner chair for eight hours hooked up to a machine and you have to have a surgical procedure to graft a tube into your arm that the machine can hook up to. So it's not a, a very great quality of life um, type of thing. Okay, so again, end-stage renal disease. Can Frank, happen. just a question. Can that be preventable? Well, yeah, you prevent it by not getting hepatitis. You prevent it by not drinking. You prevent it by taking care of your blood pressure. It's high. Um, and some patients, they're just genetically predisposed, um, you know, to having kidney disease. So there's not much they could do except live a really healthy life and postpone it and maybe, you know, never get it. Um, but uh, most, you know, end-stage renal disease is caused by, you know, just not living a good life, you know, uh, not exercising, eating too much, eating the wrong foods, um, getting hepatitis, you know, uh, drinking too much, uh, eating fatty foods, you know, all, all the things we kind of, uh, you know, do wrong. So, I mean, if you drink alcohol and get pain when you drink, okay, um, you know, that's your liver telling you that it's way too much alcohol. So if you're, you know, if you're ever, you know, I, I don't know when it is, but if you're drinking and you start getting pain in your right upper quadrant, um, that's your liver telling you that, you know, you're not, you shouldn't be drinking that. 
Um, and you know, you need to stop that, right? I mean, it's not, it's not saying, okay, I'll have one less drink because the pain is going to go away. That's telling you your liver is already traumatized. And then once that happens, right, you're going to start moving on from liver disease to kidney diseases and, and stuff like that. So, you know, your body usually will send you signals, um, that things are not, uh, not working properly. But again, you know, we all know people who drank all their lives and they're 90 years old and they don't have kidney disease. So it's, it's a, you know, it's a, uh, luck of the draw, so to speak. And some people it happens, some people it doesn't happen. Uh, but you can, you know, go to any dialysis center. They are filled pretty much day and night. They open at about, you know, six o'clock in the morning and usually close around midnight. They probably have about 50, 60 dialysis machines in there and they are filled. Um, you know, I know, you know, for us in this county, there's usually a waiting list for people to get into dialysis centers. A lot of times we have to transport them to Westchester and other places because there's just not enough dialysis uh, chairs open, you know, all the time for all these patients. I mean, COVID kind of corrected that because a whole lot of dialysis patients died, um, you know, first with the first round of COVID. So, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of corrected itself because, you know, we lost so many dialysis patients. But um, prior to COVID, you know, there was usually a waiting list of months before, you know, you would get access to dialysis in, in Rockland County. And that only happens when other dialysis patients die, right? So, I mean, you know, eventually people die and then a spot opens up and they can do it. But, um, you know, it's a problem. Like whenever we have a blizzard or, you know, power outage and people can't get to dialysis, it becomes a problem because they can only really go a day or two without uh, going on, you know, dialysis. Now, hemodialysis is the machine type of thing that I was telling you about. Peritoneal dialysis, they basically do this overnight to themselves. They have a catheter, okay, through their skin into their belly, and it's it's not sitting inside their stomach. It's not sitting inside their intestine. It's actually in the cavity, right? Your abdominal cavity, which is the the space that all those organs are in. And what they basically have is a, a, a bag that flows fluid, special fluid, okay, into their abdominal cavity. And then the tube empties. the. So there's one tube bringing fluid in, and there's another tube basically emptying out into another bag. And as that fluid travels through the abdominal cavity for like eight to 10 hours while they're sleeping, they usually do it. I don't know how they fall asleep with this in them, but I guess they get used to it eventually. That fluid somehow removes the you know, the, removes the poison that the kidneys would usually do. But the vast majority of patients do hemodialysis, okay? When your kidneys are really completely shut down, peritoneal dialysis does not work well. So the hemodialysis patient is going to be, have that done in a dialysis center, okay, 99% of the time. The peritoneal dialysis is often done in homes and often done overnight, okay? Um, now, what's some things that we need to think about or worry about as far as EMS goes. Okay, so, you know, if they're having their blood cleaned by a machine, there's all different types of issues they could go through, plus what has to happen for that machine to have a place to access, right? Is it, they need blood. So the machine's going to be hooked up to their vasculature. So these people are doing this three times a week. So what would happen if they didn't, they, they basically do a surgical procedure on them where they graft a tube, okay, and they connect an artery and a vein together into this tube. And that tube is what they actually use the needle to connect them to the machine. And those tubes can last for years. If they were actually sticking those needles in blood vessels, the blood vessels would be destroyed, you know, within a couple of months by being repeatedly stuck. So they have to actually graft these tubes into them. Now, um, uh, let me see if it shows. No, it doesn't really. <sighs> It doesn't really show a good picture of it. Um, I'll go to a different, I'll have to go to a different, um, let me just see. Okay, well, this is showing you where they put the dialysis port up in the subclavian uh, or up into the neck over here, um, but usually it's in the arm. So here, this would be a good example of it. So this is um, your, let's see, let me just look here. So here's your armpit and this is your crease of your elbow. So if you can make it out over here, this horseshoe shaped, thing. So what they basically did was they grafted an artery and a vein into a piece of tubing. Okay. And now when the nurses or the dialysis technicians access this, they have a special needle that they access with it, which is called a non-coring needle, which means that it doesn't actually take a piece of the um, tube with it when it goes through it. It pierces it, but it doesn't actually make a... Um, um, 
a damage, like a permanent hole into it. So when it's removed, it kind of seals itself and they hold direct pressure for quite a while after they take it out just to make sure it clots off. So this is actually a, you know, probably a forty, fifty thousand dollars surgical procedure by a vascular surgeon to put this in place. Okay. And it should last the patient many, many years. And obviously, if it begins to fail, they would have to do the same thing on the other side. And then if it doesn't work in the arms, they have to go up into the chest. And if they, for some reason, doesn't work up into the chest, then they would have to go into the groin. But most people don't live long enough with end-stage renal disease to have to need it changed out unless there's some type of problem. Um, again, the peritoneal... So how do you take a blood, how you take a blood pressure? So this is, well, this is what we talked about at the beginning of class. We said there's two... Uh, times that we don't do blood pressures in patients' oh. arms. So one is if they have a dialysis shunt. This is called a dialysis shunt. We should not do a blood pressure in here because what we'll actually do is cause it to clot off by putting all that pressure on it. The other one was a woman who we said had a mastectomy. A mastectomy is the removal of a breast. We don't do a blood pressure on that side. And if they have bilateral mastectomies, then we can't do blood pressures on them, right? I mean, at least you can't do it in their arms. And most people are not going to be feel, feel comfortable taking blood pressures in their lower legs. So um, those would be the two times you would not take blood pressures. So if they have dialysis shunts or if they had a mastectomy, those would be the two situations. And they know that. They usually will point that out to you right away and say, no, you can't take a blood pressure in that arm. Okay. Uh, peritoneal dialysis, I'm going to go show you some pictures in a second. But peritoneal dialysis, again, they're not hooked up to a machine. It's basically what looks like a tremendous IV bag flowing into them, and then another tube bringing that fluid out. That's typically done in the house. Okay. Um, so there's other kinds of specialized types of dialysis. So like this continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, a lot of times um, people do that um, you know, in the home and stuff like that, you know, so there's all different types. I mean, it doesn't really, you know, necessarily matter, um, matter to us and stuff, but when somebody has the peritoneal dialysis, you're clearly going to see, you know, on their outside, um, that there's a tube hanging out of their body. Okay. And again, the site, even though it's probably scarred off at this point, it's just always a risk of infection. And if it travels, you know, from the tube up into the body, it's going to the kidneys. So they're going to get very quickly get a kidney infection. Okay. Um, so what are the complications of end-stage renal disease? So one of the biggest issues is that the patient misses dialysis. So like with COVID, they were too sick to go. Okay. Um, blizzards, the staff can't get into the dialysis center, blackouts. Now the state made them all um, get generators after um, Hurricane Sandy. So that's not usually a problem. Although we did have that blackout last uh, summer and one of the dialysis center did have a generator, but it actually did not work. So they were out of service for a day while the company had to come and figure out what was wrong with the generator. Okay, so the usual problem is something to do with, you know, not getting their dialysis. And obviously what happens is the poison start to build up in their body. Um, so when that starts to happen, okay, they have too much, again, if they don't have dialysis, they're not ridding themselves of the extra fluid in their body that the kidneys are usually doing. So they start going into pulmonary edema. So they start getting short of breath. They're going to have issues with not ridding themselves of elect extra electrolytes, um, you know, the different um, substances that we get by like potassium and sodium that we get by eating food. Um, and all of these are pretty rare, okay, um, in these patients and stuff like that. Probably the most emergent thing we see in dialysis patients is bleeding from the dialysis shunt. Now they should not be, they're always, the bleeding is always stopped and controlled, okay, before they're sent home from the dialysis center, okay. Um, and uh, they're also weighed on the way into the dialysis center and weighed on the way out to make sure that they are not retaining or losing too much fluid by the dialysis. So they have a formula so if the, let's say the patient comes in and weighs 150 pounds on the way in, you know, they'll have a formula. I don't know exactly what the formula is, but they'll know that the patient should come out probably weighing around 150 pounds. So if they're too low, it means they took too much fluid out of them and they're now going to be dehydrated. So they have to actually give them some fluid. And if they come up too heavy, they didn't take out enough fluid and they run a risk of going into, you know, congestive heart failure because there's just too much fluid in their body. So most of the times they're on top of it and we don't really get emergencies, but sometimes there's bleeding emergencies. So I'm gonna to have to switch to a different PowerPoint in a second um, to kind of show it to you and stuff like that. But again, 
The AV fistula is the shunt, arterial venous fistula, the connection. That's what I was showing in the guy's arm and stuff like that. Um, so it's, it's a little different than normal bleeding control. And we kind of hold off with a tourniquet to the last possible minute, because if you put a tourniquet on this, you destroy that whole shunt thing, and they're going to need a whole surgical procedure again uh, to put a new one in a different extremity. Okay. Um, infections are pretty rare because at the dialysis center, they, um, they use total aseptic technique, right? I mean, they're, you know, they're in sterile gloves, um, a mask, you know, nine times. So it's pretty rare at the dialysis center, they're going to get an infection, but obviously if the patient doesn't take care to clean themselves, there's always a, you know, a probability that something could happen. And then again, with the peritoneal dialysis, where you saw the tube on their abdomen, they run the risk of again, entering bacteria into their stomach, with your stomach cavity, the abdominal cavity, which is called peritonitis, right? Which is an infection of the peritoneum, the, the basically the abdominal cavity. Okay, um, so we're gonna talk about bleeding in a second, I'll go to it, but again, it's gonna be direct pressure. You're probably gonna need hemostatic dressings. Okay, and again, a tourniquet if you cannot control it, but we usually you know, try for a little longer than we would if it was like somebody slashed with a knife, because we know that if we put that tourniquet on, you know, yes, we're going to stop the bleeding, but we're going to also destroy the shunt. So if we can wait and give it an extra minute or two normally than we would, okay. Obviously, if they're bleeding, they need oxygen. And let's just go through the review, and then I'll show you some other pictures of, you know, what it looks like and stuff like that. Okay, so we this was just a quick review. We know that the red blood cells, okay, um, are the one of the, the formed elements of the blood, and it carries car removes carbon dioxide and carries oxygen. The white blood cells have with bleeding, okay? I'm sorry, a, a platelets have with a bleeding control, and the white blood cells have with infection, okay? And that the plasma is the fluid portion of the blood that everything is floating through. Anemia is the medical term for not having enough red blood cells. And again, the most common cause of anemia is, ble is bleeding. Uh, it could be just a normal side effect of a woman menstruating once a month, uh, a normal side effect of a woman losing blood, giving birth and stuff like that. Okay, sickle cell anemia is a special genetic problem where instead of the cell, uh, red blood cell being round, kind of looking like a hockey puck, it looks like that sickle um, that we talked about, the, the, the special, uh, I guess, knife or device that they use to uh, cut the wheat. And because of that, it basically clogs up the arteries and can lead to a lot of different problems, any type of clotting problem, pulmonary embolism, strokes, anything like that, heart attacks. Um, so not too, too common. We said the renal system, again, is the kidney system that has to clean the blood and remove um, the urine from the body. And that the, the main issues we see as far as kidney problems would be kidney stones or urinary tract infections. And that people who have untreated uh, renal disease, kidney disease will develop um, end-stage renal disease, which requires them to go on to dialysis, okay? And then I'm going to show you some pictures of what happens with the bleeding of dialysis, okay? And again, the bleeding is only going to be in the hemodialysis. The chemo is blood. That's where they're hooked up to the machine, and they had that special connection of their blood breasts. The peritoneal dialysis, their bigger problem is more usually infection, and I'll show you some pictures of that in a second, okay? Um, and again, as far as problems with dialysis, it usually relates to the fact that for some reason they could not get the dialysis. Like with COVID, you know, it was because the dialysis centers initially weren't set up to have COVID patients in there, and the hospitals have basically given up doing in-hospital dialysis because it wasn't a money maker. So they were telling people not to come, then there was problems with the staff getting COVID, and there weren't enough staff, so it was all different issues in the first time. Now they got it pretty much, um, you know, uh, down pat and stuff like that. And they have, they do have at least the, the two dialysis centers I've seen in Rockland, they do have one or two isolation rooms that they could do dialysis on patients that have infection um, and not contaminate the whole um, dialysis center, stuff like that. Okay, so we have a patient transported routinely for dialysis three times a week. She's sick and canceled the trip yesterday. Now she's saying she can't breathe and feels like she's going to die. Okay, so obviously what happened was because she missed her dialysis, she retained fluid, right? Because the dialysis machine acts as the kidneys and helps to remove extra fluid from the body. And because of that, she's basically filled up with fluid, which is backing up into her lungs. So she's going into congestive heart failure slash acute pulmonary edema. So again, our treatment would be to get her on oxygen and consider possibly the use of CPAP on her, depending on you know other things that we don't see here, her vital signs and stuff like that. 
but she's, you know, she's basically a congestive heart failure patient. Her lungs are full of fluid instead of air and she feels like she's drowning. So that's what's kind of happening with her. Okay, so let me um, find the other PowerPoint. So this is what someone would look like that's on hemodialysis, okay? So what they, there's two ways they do it. What we saw the picture of, okay, is here where they connected a vein into that tube and then they brought that tube and connected it with an artery. So this graph, this piece of plastic is actually a high pressure vessel because it is hooked up to an artery, okay? And then the other way is where they actually take the vein and connect it to the artery um, without having this artificial thing, but this is not the common way that they're doing it anymore. Um, so you could see here, right? They have two different tubes going into them. There's blood flowing through a machine that has filters built into it. And, um, you know, it's basically going to uh, cleanse their blood. Um, now the bleeding of a dialysis patient, okay? So this, uh, this lady had her shunt in her subclavian up in her upper chest and she started to bleed. So you could see it kind of looks like a, a murder scene. So it's, it can definitely have, um, you know, pretty serious bleeding consequences because again, you have an artery and a vein uh, connected together, okay? So, you know, there's a couple of different reasons. Again, the repeated punctures can lead to it. I'll show you what the pseudo aneurysm, the word pseudo means it looks like an aneurysm, but it's really not, okay? So a pseudo aneurysm is that because this again is somebody's arm where the that shunt is in. So because you have an artery and a vein connected the, and the artery is high pressure, sometimes they'll have massive dilation, right? Because of that high pressure of the blood vessel. And it'll look horrible, it'll look like that's what the emergency is, but that's actually how it looks their whole life now. Uh, there's no complication, okay? If, okay, you get something that looks like this, that means that blood vessel burst, okay? Down here is gonna be cold and lifeless because nothing, this is actually like a huge pressure ball on their arm and nothing is gonna get below it, okay? So this is a surgical, vascular surgical emergency that has to be fixed immediately. Um, this is just, you know, common. That's the way they're gonna be all the time, even though this looks like it's a real emergency. So that's just kind of the side effect of having a dialysis shunt where you have an artery and a vein connected together. Now, as far as the bleeding goes, okay, so I don't know if you can make it out. I mean, but can you see the blood spurting kind of over here? It's like a little red line coming out. And can you see there's two people doing it? There's the guy with the blue gloves and the guy with the white gloves. So really to control and ignore this wrong way for a second, because it's not, it's not actually right. To really control um, the bleeding, what you need to do is have one guy, and I use the term guy interchangeably, um, but you need to have one person press on the artery and the vein at the same time, okay? And then the other person puts direct pressure where the bleeding is occurring. So the reason why is if we were to just put direct pressure, again, you have an artery and a vein feeding it, it's never gonna clot off. If you were just to press on the vein or press on one side and not both, you still have blood coming into it. So you have to you have to tamponade both blood vessels. Like normally when we have bleeding, right? We have bleeding along a blood vessel. So if it's bleeding here and we press above it, okay, and put pressure, there's gonna be less bleeding from here. So it's not a big issue, right? We put a tourniquet here, there's not gonna be any bleeding from here. We put direct pressure from here, there's gonna be less pressure, uh, less bleeding from here. We put some direct pressure on this and it's gonna stop bleeding. But here, because this tube is being fed by two different blood vessels, 
the first thing you have to do is tampon out or push down on those two different blood vessels. Then you have to push down on the site of the bleeding. So that's what I was kind of getting at, that it's a, a two-person procedure, okay? And again, if you're having problems controlling it, so I think this is a good picture that illustrates it. Um, they're only putting pressure on one side of the shunt. So what is the shunt doing? Can you see it spurting the blood out? Um, so that's the problem. So you need to have somebody press above and below it, and then you'll be able to control the bleeding, okay? Because it's being fed on both sides. And, uh, and then, I'm sorry, above and below it, and then press, have the other person press directly down on it, okay? And that's the way you would actually control the bleeding, okay? So just doing that, all it'll do is soak up blood. That's the wrong way of doing it. And this was a person who came home from dialysis and was uh, changing out of their clothes and somehow or another started the shunt bleeding. Nobody knows why because the guy died, but he somehow started the blood, the, the shunt bleeding. He called the dialysis center and said, I'm bleeding from my shunt. So they said, we'll take a cab back and we'll fix it for you. So he actually called the cab and when the cab was honking the horn outside, he went in the elevator and basically at that point it lost so much blood, he collapsed. Okay, and, and when the elevator opened, he kind of stumbled out and collapsed on the ground. The, the cab beeped a few more times and when he didn't come, drove away. And he just was laying there bleeding to death. And a few minutes, I guess, after he collapsed or who knows how long after he collapsed, somebody else came to use the elevator and found this guy laying there in a puddle of blood and called the police. And the police thought it was a crime scene. They thought the guy, there was so much blood that he'd been shot or stabbed or something like that. And uh, only on autopsy was the medical examiner able to figure out that, you know, the bleeding was from his dialysis shunt. And they were able to figure out, you know, they got into his apartment. They saw there was blood all over the floor in the apartment. There was a trail of blood from his apartment to the elevator. There was a trail of blood, you know, elevator outside and stuff like that. So it is possible for them to bleed to death. Again, it's rare because most of the times the dialysis center does a good job making sure the bleeding's controlled and stuff. But like in this case, the patient did something to, you know, aggravate their bleeding and stuff like that. Sorry, I um, now, let me just see if I have a picture of the, um, the, nope. Uh, let me just do this then. I thought I had better pictures of the peritoneal dialysis. So, let's see if there's any, oh, I guess we can look at this for now. Okay. Okay, so basically somebody who has peritoneal dialysis has a tube that's surgically placed in their abdominal cavity, not in any particular organ. It's just sitting in the space between all the different organs, okay? On the outside, there's a uh, connection and then they have their dialysis, peritoneal dialysis uh, bag. So the bag basically has special uh, solution in it called dialysis solution. I don't know what it's made of, but when it's infused into the body, okay, it helps to draw the toxins, the poisons, the waste products, okay, out of the patient. And then the fluid comes back out a different tubing, okay, that, so this will be run in, you know, over a period of hours, okay. And then they, then they, there's a, a switch, a stopcock that would then shut the fluid from coming down into them. And then they would empty it, it empties into a different bag and it's then dis, dis, um, discarded, thrown away, okay? So they do this usually, like I said, overnight. Um, you know, they could do it during the daytime. It doesn't have to be overnight, but they could do it, uh, uh, but they have to be, you know, basically immobile. I think this is another picture, if you could see over here, where it comes in, okay, and then basically goes out. So here they're showing you that it's basically filling up the abdominal cavity, which is the space that all your abdominal organs, and somehow or another, I don't know the exact, 
um, technology, but it uh, actually draws the um, or cleanses the uh, the body of the toxins and stuff like that. Okay, so I've never had anybody with an emergency saying there's a problem or anything like that. Um, I've had calls where they couldn't get it to work and they wanted to be taken to the hospital because they needed dialysis and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I've never had any emergencies. They just basically needed transport. So, I mean, over here, they're showing us that they're sitting reading a book. So I guess, you know, other than the fact that you're bound to the bag, um, you know, you can do what you need to do. I guess most people just do it at night because, you know, why tie yourself up for hours at a time, um, you know, during the daytime and stuff like that. But, um, you know, I mean, again, this guy looks like he's wheeling around a dialysis bag on a IV pole. So it looks like you can do what you need to do whenever you need to do it. Um, but again, usually there's no emergency with it or anything like that. Okay, so anything, any questions on the blood disorders or anything like that, the, the renal disease or anything like that that we went over now? Okay, so let's take, what time is it? It's 9.10. Um, do you want to start the, maybe do the anatomy and physiology part of OBGYN and that'll save us a little bit of time. So you want to go like take a break and then do maybe like another 45 minutes um, that way and then we'll save some time tomorrow night. Yep. Okay, fine. So okay. let's let's take a break. It's uh it's 9-11. Um, so come back about 9.30 and then we'll go to say 10, 10, 15 and then we'll uh we'll call it a night. Okay. Okay, so now we're recording. Uh, I think we are. Let's see. Yep. Okay. So this is gonna be a long chapter. So what we'll do is let's review the anatomy of physiology. It's uh what time is it now? It's 9.30, and uh, we'll see how we feel uh, after we review the anatomy and physiology part of it, okay? Okay, so from the anatomy standpoint, so um, let me see if I have a picture. Okay, so let's start here. So this is the, the, the female reproductive system, okay? So what do we have? We have a uterus, which is basically a hollow muscle, okay? All the uterus is is a very strong, smooth muscle that is hollow. When a woman is not pregnant, it's about the size of her fist. And then obviously once she gets pregnant, the baby is growing in here inside the amniotic sac inside of here, and it expands to whatever size the baby is, okay? Um, the top of the uterus is called the fundus. It's just a description like a landmark. It doesn't, there's nothing special other than they call the top the fundus. We're gonna talk about fundal height to trying to determine if a woman's giving birth or not, meaning that if you see the bump of her belly up under her xiphoid process, more than likely, she's not actually going to deliver in the immediate, you know, the immediate couple of minutes. But if the fundal height is down by her belly button, by her umbilical um, umbilicus, then that means the baby has traveled downward. So in other words, if this height now is, you know, well, it's always going to be here. But what I'm saying, if you see the bulge further down, it means the baby has traveled down into what they call the birth canal, right, which is a space over here of the cervix, which is the opening from the the uterus into the vagina, okay? And then obviously from the vagina, it's a short distance travel to the outside of the body, okay? So that's kind of one part of it. Now, what else do we have? A woman has two ovaries. The ovaries are the egg producing um, structures and that usually once a month, a single egg, sometimes two eggs, but most of the times one egg is released by an ovary, okay? And it goes into what's called the fallopian tube. So here you see the fallopian tube is cross-section. So you can actually see it. It's a tube. The fallopian tube does not directly connect to the um, uh, ovary. But it's very close. And it has these little finger-like projections that you see over there that are doing this all the time. They're moving like this. So the egg actually tunnels up out of the ovary. Okay, And a woman is born with all her eggs. Um, so, you know, there's a finite amount of eggs, um, you know, that are there, but typically once a month, one egg tunnels up and is released by the ovary and scooped up by the fallopian tube. Okay. And then it starts to travel down the fallopian tube. Now for a woman to get pregnant, what has to happen? Okay. So first she has to ovulate, which is release the egg. The egg has to be get into the fallopian tube and start to travel into it. Then she has to have had sex, right? So she had sex. The man's penis injects sperm into her vagina, which swims up her uterus. 
and believe it or not, continues to swim up into the fallopian tube. And if it meets the egg, right, the egg that was released by the ovary, the sperm will pierce the egg and what's, what's called cell division will occur, which means that everything you need to make the baby is contained in the egg and the sperm. So once the sperm pierces the wall of the um, the egg, it's called an ovum, the egg, uh, it, that egg will start to divide, those cells will start to divide, and it actually starts to become the baby. Obviously, it doesn't look anything like a baby yet. It's supposed to continue to float and fall into the uterus in preparation for um, having the baby, right? So when the woman starts to ovulate, the walls of the uterus, remember this is a muscular wall, so it's technically a smooth muscle, but the wall of the uterus actually gets thick and fluffy. So that as the egg falls, it lands in this thick fluffy lining and implants into it and starts to grow blood vessels um, and the egg divides into the placenta, the, you know, the, the actual baby, the umbilical, um, the um, amniotic sac, like everything you need to make the baby is contained or will grow from that egg, okay? But if this uh, wall did not get thick and um, uh, fluffy, right, then the implantation cannot take place and the egg would not grow. So a lot of things have to be perfect. In other words, you have to ovulate. It has to be a healthy egg. You have to have had sex. The sperm has to be healthy. The sperm actually has to find the egg and pierce it. And then cell division has to take place. It has to continue to travel and fall into the uterus and plant in the right spot and start to grow, right? So that's why sometimes it's easy to get pregnant. Sometimes it's not. Now we have some different emergencies that could occur, but before we talk about those, the, um, the ovaries are, I don't wanna say free floating, okay? But they're held in place by a ligament but they actually can move a little bit. And also the same thing with the fallopian tube. There, so there's a little bit of movement. There is a small one in a million chance that the egg can be released and actually not get sucked up into the fallopian tube, but actually fall into the abdominal cavity. And then there's a one in a trillion chance that the sperm will actually swim out and find the egg in the um, abdominal cavity and actually impregnate it. And they have a uh, pregnancy out of the uterus, okay? which most of the times does not actually become a viable pregnancy um, or anything like that, but uh, it is theoretically possible for that to, uh, that to happen, okay? Um, now, what else could happen? What about if the egg fertilizes and it gets stuck in the fallopian tube? So now the danger is it's stuck, okay? And usually the reason it gets stuck is that a woman had repeated um, disease, sexually transmitted diseases, doesn't mean that she did anything wrong. It's just that she could have got a bacteria that was introduced up into here and traveled and stuff like that, but they call it a sexually transmitted disease. Um, you know, she could have had a previous, um, it's called an ectopic pregnancy or a tubal pregnancy when it gets stuck in here. So the fertilization of the egg is supposed to take place in the fallopian tube, but the egg is supposed to travel and fall into the uterus. So if it gets stuck in here, what's the problem? We said the egg is dividing, it's growing right? So if it gets stuck in here and it continues to grow, it's going to burst the tube. And running alongside the tube is the uh, fallopian artery and the fallopian vein. You see they're kind of showing in the picture here. So if you burst the tube, you sever the fallopian artery and vein, and it becomes a life-threatening bleeding emergency. So that's the problem. Now, when women have ectopic pregnancies, you know, we usually have certain um, clues, right? So it's a woman of childbearing age, so that could be anywhere from like 12 to, you know, 60 something, I guess. Um, she had to be sexually active, okay? Which means she, you know, she had to have sex in the time since her last period. And they typically have um, what they call unilateral abdominal pain. They have abdominal pain on one side because it's one tube. Now, some women don't feel it on one side. So they'll just complain of generalized pain or they may be pointing towards the center. Again, if the egg, you know, got stuck real close to it, they could complain towards the stomach, but they usually have one-sided abdominal pain. And there can, if it bursts, be severe bleeding, but usually they will um, have symptoms, go into their OBGYN, be told they have an ectopic pregnancy and either be given medicine. Um, it's an old chemo agent. I can't remember um, the name of it is, mexotrexate. Um, they give them to dissolve it. Um, if it's already at the point where it looks like it may burst, they may actually have to have surgery. Um, now, I've had quite a few times where women call us to the house, and they said they were to their OBGYN. They were told they have an ectopic pregnancy. They were scheduled for a procedure 
five, seven days later, and you know they're in that five or seven day window waiting for their procedure, and now they're bleeding. So all it means was that the obstetrician was busy. He couldn't schedule them earlier, so he, he sent them home, and they didn't have enough time, and they started to actually bleed, and that's why they called 911. So that's, you know, that's, a, that's a hemorrhage emergency. It's a hemorrhage emergency that we cannot fix because we cannot stop the bleeding. So it's really something that has to get into the hospital, but it's just a, you know, a bleeding emergency. I mean, none of these women were bleeding to the point where it was life-threatening, but they were definitely, you know, spotting and stuff like that. Now, in your um, clientele, right, you go to the woman and she has unilateral abdominal pain. You look at her and you say, okay, you know, she looks like she could have babies. And then you say to her, well, you know, are you sexually active? <laughs> it's not going to happen, right? I mean, first of all, you guys probably wouldn't ask. And second of all, she's not going to tell you. So, you know, what happens in the Jewish world with all this uh, OBGYN is that we, we really become a taxi cab. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, they, God forbid, you actually have to vaginally deliver it in the ambulance. You know, it's, it's, it's probably a hundred times harder than anything else because, you know, modesty and this and that and everything. So it, it, you definitely, you have your work cut out for you. Getting a history is very hard. Like, you know, uh, you, you know, have you had any babies before? Yes. Okay. Were there any issues? Dead silence. You know, so it's like, it, it, they're just not very forthcoming with any of the information that you kind of, you know, want to get and stuff like that. And most of these women are, you know, gram, uh, gram positive, strep positive. So you don't really want to vaginally deliver it without the mother getting a dose of antibiotics to pr protect the baby, you know, and so there's just, there's a multitude of issues. Plus you have women who've had, you know, anywhere probably from four to 10 babies and uh, with every successive pregnancy, this uterus, which is just a muscle, has been stretched and stretched and stretched, and it becomes harder for it to contract and push the baby out. So, you know, it sometimes can happen where they get, you know, basically a floppy uterus that it doesn't have any strength left to push, and they can't actually push it out, and it becomes a very prolonged delivery. And obviously, in the hospital, at some point, they would make a decision to C-section the baby um, and take it out surgery. But we don't have that luxury in the field. So, definitely obstetrical stuff. In the, in the Jewish world, especially in the Jewish world where women have multiple, multiple babies into later in life, you know, presents with a lot of different emergencies that most people, you know, don't see, um, or most, you know, most EMS people don't see, or even most obstetricians don't see unless they're servicing, you know, a, uh, a population that has those, you know, those, those amounts of babies later in life and stuff like that. Okay, so let's go back. So the vagina was the connection from the outside of the body to the uterus. The opening of the uterus to the vagina is called the cervix. And this is the muscle that has to relax to allow the baby to um, deliver. So they talk about the dilation of the cervix and they talk about the effacement or the thinning of the tissue down here to allow the baby to actually pass through the cervix into the vagina to actually be delivered, right? So again, the vagina smooth muscle, the, the um, the uterus is smooth muscle. It's just a type of muscle. You know, where we had uh, skeletal muscle and we had smooth muscle. Skeletal muscles in the skeleton. Smooth muscle was in the lungs, the blood vessels, reproductive tract, the gastrointestinal tract, um, lungs, and stuff like that. And then we had the specialized muscle called cardiac muscle. And again, on the test, the only thing that's special about cardiac muscle is they has the ability to initiate its own impulse, where all these other muscles need the brain to tell it to do something. Okay. Then we had the ovaries, which were those two sacs that produced the eggs. Okay. And then the eggs are travel from the ovaries through the fallopian tubes into the uterus. And that fertilization, which is the egg meeting the, um, I'm sorry, the sperm meeting the egg, okay, um, takes place in the fallopian tube, but the egg is supposed to, after it's fertilized, to continue to travel down and implant inside the, uh, in the uterus. If it gets stuck in the tube, we call it an ectopic or tubal, like T-U-B-A-L, tubal pregnancy, okay? And that can become a life-threatening emergency if the egg continues to travel and ruptures the, um, the fallopian tube and causes bleeding, okay? Uh, what else do we have here? Oh, just a, a couple other little interesting things that could happen. Um, some women, when they ovulate, okay, uh, feel intense pain. It's called middle, middle schmerz. I think it translates in Yiddish to pain in the middle of the month. Um, so actually the medical term is a Yiddish word. Um, I, I've had once or twice very, very young uh, girls 
uh, kind of home alone, you know, no mom type of thing who had such intense pain that, you know, they thought something horrible was coming on. You know, one time we even thought it was an um, appendicitis because she had like lower right quadrant abdominal pain, but it was just basically turned out when they did a sonogram that turned out to be that she was probably just ovulating and stuff like that. The other thing that could happen is that when the egg bursts um, through, there's actually a hole, right? That has to heal in the ovary. So there's a possibility for women to get infections. You've heard of ovarian cysts and stuff like that or polycystic ovaries. So there's all different issues. So if a woman who is ovulated, okay, is in her cycle to the point where she's ovulated, all of a sudden develops fever and chills and lower quadrant abdominal pain, um, it could be that she has an ovarian cyst that got infected. So, you know, there's a lot of, you know, we're, we're mainly going to talk about the OB side of it, but from the GYN side of it, the gynecological side of it, there's lots and lots of things, um, you know, that could go wrong. Uh, fortunately, most of them are not, um, you know, life-threatening problems or anything like that. Okay, so now we're up to, right, we have the fallopian tubes, we have the ovaries, the egg comes down, it comes into the uterus, which is basically a muscle that is hollow. Again, when a woman is not pregnant, it's about the size of her fist, and then it grows to great size. Um, the process of, um, you know, the monthly process of preparing to get pregnant, different hormones are secreted into the bloodstream, and it causes the walls of the uterus, the internal walls of the uterus to get thick and fluffy, so that when the egg falls, it has a place to implant. Now, where it falls is also pretty important. But we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the top of the uterus, again, just as a landmark, we said is called the fundus, okay? And we're gonna talk later about fundal height, okay? And that the opening of the uterus into the vagina is called the cervix, okay? And that that has to relax to be able to, for the baby to actually be able to uh, deliver, okay? And obviously we said that the uterus can stretch and grow. So it's not really growing, but it's stretching to accommodate whatever size the baby is, okay? And again, the cervix is that muscular ring that has to relax and, and uh, thin out to allow the baby to deliver, okay? Um, trying to think what else we could talk about on this. Uh, it is, I mean, later when we talk about emergencies, it is possible to, for a woman to uh, rupture her uterus, which basically becomes a life-threatening emergency. Um, you know, and it was surgical, it has to be a C-section. And then after that, she more than likely has to have a um, hysterectomy where they remove all of this out of her body it is possible for a uterus to prolapse outside of the body where it basically folds down and comes out of the vagina and leaves the body. Um, and again, the more pregnancies that a woman has, the more possible it has. A woman who's had a C-section where the, the uterus was cut open to have the baby removed, then that scar can rupture, right, during pregnancy if she's having a vaginal, you know, most people have a C-section, um, subsequently always have C-sections. In the Jewish world, uh, what happens is because they're going to have so many babies, they really can't do too many C-sections on this uterus because every time you cut into it, there's a scar. So what usually happens is if they had a C-section, it was because it was emergent. And then if they get a you know gutsy obstetrician, they will actually vaginally deliver it. Okay, But there's a risk in vaginally delivering it, which means there's scar tissue that's developed that could rupture. And since most Jewish women are having a baby within say 18 months of the first one, that scar is not really completely healed. And there's always a chance that when you have a vaginal delivery after a C-section that it, there actually could be a rupture of the uterus. Um, so there's you know all kinds of problems and there's all kinds of problems that very rarely happen, but would happen more in the, in the Jewish population, just again, because of the amount of babies and the um, the age that women continue to deliver into um, or continue to have babies in childbirth into. So, you know, there, there will, you know, there, there can reach a point um, where these emergencies become, you know, more likely to happen. But with better screening and stuff nowadays, they can almost predict problems. And, you know, again, it may be a situation where the woman would have to go in early. It may be a situation where they say, that's it for vaginal deliveries you know, you're now, you know, that's it. This is your last one. You're going to have a C-section and you're not going to be able to, you know, have, uh, you know, any more babies or anything like that. Um, so I said 18 months, somebody put in 12 months, but whatever. <laughs> um, okay. And it says, how do twins happen? So twins can happen uh, a bunch of different ways, but, uh, you know, sometimes two eggs are released. Okay. It could happen that one egg splits, 
Um, you know, so there's a lot of different ways that uh, twins can happen. But, um, you know, it, it's, it, I mean, you could even have, um, you know, women who are, uh, what's the right word? Um, I'm just tired tonight. You know, they have problems getting pregnant. So they're going for, um, uh, I forgot the term, but they're basically taking Infertility. shots. Yeah, right. So they're infertility treatments that are taking shots to encourage them, the woman to ovulate. So sometimes those women release multiple eggs and you could actually have, you know, multiple uh, pregnancies. OK, um, so, um, you know, we we actually have uh, where I live, we had a, we have a woman who lives here who they tried for seven years. She couldn't get pregnant and um, she went down to the city for uh infertility treatment and she was going to have to take shots except her husband couldn't do it because he kept on fainting so my wife used to go over there and give her these shots and stuff like that and then she got pregnant had a baby and once she had that first baby she's had nine more you know um since then so it just really took the having the first one to fix whatever the problem was with the infertility so it was, it was pretty interesting um the other thing that happened again is because you may have so many eggs, or sometimes they actually implant eggs, right? So they'll harvest eggs out of the ovary. If the if if the problem is not the person, the woman's ovary, they'll actually harvest eggs. And in that case, they'll take three or four or five eggs, okay, and then implant them because they want to make sure at least one gets fertilized. And then you could have the situation where multiple eggs get fertilized. Um, so you know, in the non-Jewish world, people would probably you know, choose to have one baby. So they'll tell them to get rid of the other fertilized eggs. A lot of times in the Jewish world, they'll say, okay, you know, three fertilized, I guess I'm having three babies. So now all of a sudden they have triplets. Um, so, you know- I have siblings four, quadruplets. From, artif from artificially or naturally? No, my mother has um, cystic ovaries, what do you say? Oh, polycystic poly so poly ovaries. Yeah. Well, polycystic ovaries just means that they develop a lot of cysts, but your mother probably, um, you know, was one of those women where her ovaries is, is releasing more than one egg, um, you know, type of thing routinely. So yeah, uh, they're all is, healthy and they all have kids already. Okay. Thank God. Okay. Uh, somebody asked yeah. what birth control does. So there's all different types of birth control. There's, there's, there's birth control that stops the sperm from actually entering into the uterus. Then there's pills that people take that interfere with the hormones that need to be released. Um, to start the pregnancy cycle, right? So they basically interfere with the ability to actually have the egg release because for the egg to release, there has to be certain hormones, levels of certain hormones. So there's a lot of different things, different types of birth control. Um, but basically long and short, birth control just makes it less likely for a woman to actually be able to fertilize the egg, the, either the egg to be released or for the fertilization of the egg to take place. Um, doesn't mean it's 100%. Uh, no, you know, no, no birth control is a hundred percent, but uh, just definitely makes it uh, less. And, and, and um, an IUD, that's what somebody asking. That is a device that's inserted. Okay. To stop. It's an inter interuterine device. It's a device that's inserted in the uterus to stop the sperm from entering um, up into the um, uterus and then making it up into the fallopian tubes. Frank, uh, just uh... I want to go back a minute to the ectopic pregnancy. Mm -hmm. If that ruptures and it's not bleeding, is that going to be a bleeding to the to the vagina? Or Absolutely. So, so I should. So, so it could be both. So that's a really good question. So, if the blood makes it into the tube, then it'll be it'll be vaginal bleeding. If the blood is just leaking out into the abdominal cavity, there can be no vaginal bleeding. So most of the times there is some vaginal bleeding, but it may, may not show you accurately how much bleeding is occurring because some of it may actually be in the abdominal cavity. So that's a very good question. So it could be either way. It could be, you have both bleeding in both places. You could only have bleeding through the vagina. You can only have bleeding into the abdominal cavity. So you don't see anything out of the vagina, but most of the times it's a combination of both. Okay, so, um, None of this stuff that we're going to talk about now is on the test, but the process of getting pregnant requires two hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Um, most birth control pills contain high levels of estrogen, which basically throws off the thing that's supposed to happen, doesn't allow the egg to release the over the egg, um, the ovary to release the egg. Um, but I'm not sure if there's birth control that has progesterone just, but I know most are estrogen containing birth control pills. 
Okay, so, but if everything is gonna go perfectly, the naturally in the woman, these two hormone levels start to rise and it triggers the things that we need to happen, happen. So it tri triggers the ovary to release the egg. The egg is called the ovum. It causes the walls of the uterus to thicken and soften in preparation for that egg. If it gets fertilized to flop into it and have a place, okay? And at the fallopian tubes, okay, peristalsis, you remember we used as a term for food moving through your esophagus and your digestive tract. That's how the food moves through. It's basically the muscles kind of squeezing the food through. Same thing happens with the fallopian tube. So that's how the egg, the egg is not, doesn't have like a motor to travel it through the fallopian tube. It's the fallopian tube itself starts to squeeze and push the, uh, gently push the egg through, okay? And then if the woman does not get pregnant, so none of this happens, the wall got thicker, but the egg never came or it never got fertilized. There was no sperm, she didn't have sex, whatever it is. So nothing fell into the uterus. What will happen is the uterus will um, shed that thick lining, okay? And it actually looks, um, you know, that, that lining is basically blood vessels and, and tissue. And that's the blood that you see that, you know, that a, a woman has leaving her body when she um, bleeds during, you know, after she has her, her cycle, okay? So that's what it basically is. And that's why some women obviously become anemic. Um, um, I mean, not anemic to the point usually that there, if there's any emergency, but they definitely will feel uh, weaker and tireder when they're actually shedding that, um, that lining out. Okay, again, the term fertilization basically means that the sperm, which was what the man has, reaches the egg, which is what the woman produced, okay? Again, sperm comes from the man's penis. The ovum or egg comes from the ovaries, okay? Once the ovum is fertilized, that just means the sperm met it, pierced it, and starts the cell division. They don't call the egg an egg anymore. They call it an embryo or basically a tiny little, you know, uh, immature baby, okay? The embryo floats or tr continues to travel down the fallopian tube, falls into the uterus, implants, and starts to divide in everything you need to make the baby, right? So the placenta is going to develop. Everything's going to develop that you need to make the baby. Now, where it implants is important, too. So when the egg falls in, you'd like it to implant on the sides, okay? You don't want it, definitely don't want it to implant up here, so where it'd be hanging. So in other words, as the placenta starts to develop, which is the organ that nourishes the baby and stuff like that, it's gonna be always hanging because there's always a risk it could, um, it could dislodge. Okay, you could have what's called a um, abruptio placenta or uh, abruption of the placenta, or ripping of the placenta. And then you don't want it to fall down here and implant because it's gonna interfere with the baby to, uh, being able to be vaginally delivered and that's called placenta previa. So it is important where it implants and obviously, you know, God made us a certain way that 99.9% .9 of the time it implants on the sides where it's supposed to and there's no issue. Um, if a woman had a C-section, there's a higher risk of it having an abnormal implantation because there's gonna be a scar. So if for some reason, now again, they know where to cut to reduce all these risks and stuff like that, right? So, I mean, unless it's an emergency C-section where they're gonna cut the first place they can see, they're very careful on where they cut so that the scar is not gonna be in a place where the egg could actually hit because if there's a scar and the egg falls on it, it's just gonna slide right off the scar and continue to travel. So if you didn't have this thickening of the walls, the egg would actually fall, hit its smooth muscle. It'd be like hitting your hand. It would then basically slide and fall right out. So that's why it has to thicken so that it has a place to actually land into and then start to grow, okay? Um, okay, so this is again, another picture, but basically showing you the egg is released, okay? And continues to travel. At some point it meets the sperm, right? The sperm is o over here, the egg meets. Now it's called an embryo. It continues to travel. It falls into the uterus and plants because the wall of the uterus got nice and thick. And now it's gonna grow hopefully into a nice healthy baby. Okay, any questions so far? What's that, uh, what I heard once that uh, uh, it's getting developed an empty sac. What was this, I'm sorry? I heard once that uh, a woman develops an empty sac, like she, it feels like she's pregnant, but the sac is empty because there's no baby in the sac. There's no baby, in, so there's an amniotic sac without a baby inside of it? Some, I don't know, I didn't want to- Okay, so, so I'll, I'll tell you what, you know, I mean, since we're doing it by Zoom, uh, you know, I'm not an obstetrician. I've delivered a few babies, uh, but I'm not an obstetrician. I do have a phenomenal female obstetrician um, that teaches the ladies for me. 
Um, if you guys want a class taught by a person who actually does this day in and day out, you know, I can ask her, it's by Zoom, and you could have her shut off her video if anybody's offended at looking at a woman. Um, but, um, you know, she probably could answer all those kinds of questions. Um, you know, she works at, um, um, at uh, Ezra's Holom, and she's delivering, you know, probably hundreds of babies a year. So I'm sure she's seen everything and anything um, as far as, uh, you know, obstetrical emergencies. But I could ask her, you know, I could definitely send her a text tomorrow and say, uh, you know, can, is there such a thing or has it ever happened? Uh, my, my understanding of medicine is that if it's possible, it has happened at some point to someone and someone's heard of it. Is it common? Probably not. But I, I can definitely ask. Um, somebody has to do both sides ovulate. Usually one egg is released, but it is possible to have more than one egg released, obviously, because there's, you know, twins sometimes and triplets and stuff like that. But usually uh, there's, you know, one egg that's released. Um, and the reason why, if you think about it, is that, you know, most of the times, you know, you, you, you're, a woman's born with a finite amount of eggs. So you don't want to just shoot out 50 eggs, you know, and then, and then, you know, have the chance that, you know, you just wasted a whole bunch of them. And then also the risk is that what happens a lot of them fertilize, like, what are you going to do with them all? So usually it's just, uh, you know, one egg. Um, okay. So that's what, what usually goes wrong for a uh, miscarriage? Um, it depends. There's a lot of different things. A lot of times it's just, uh, it's just the baby that there was probably a problem with the makeup of the sperm or the makeup of the egg. Okay. Um, the body can actually sense sometimes if it's not really a healthy, you know, uh, embryo and it'll abort it. So it's, it's kind of hard to tell. It could be trauma. It could be hypoxia in the mother. Uh, it could be infection in the mother. Like, let's say the you know, mother's pregnant, everything's fine and she gets a bad infection. So that in itself can cause, right? Because so the way the body sees the, the baby, the embryo, the growing baby is what's called a parasite. A parasite is something that feeds on something else. So the way it works is that the body would actually, the, your, the woman's body would get rid of the baby and try to save the mother. So it always deprives the baby to keep the mother alive. And that's because if you keep the mother alive, there's always a chance she can get pregnant again. If you deprive things to the mother, like oxygen or sugar or whatever, um, you know, then the mother dies. If the mother dies, the baby dies. So it, the way it works is if a mother's hypoxic, let's say she's having an asthma attack and you get a pulse ox of 80, that means the pulse ox in the baby is much lower because the, the body will send the oxygen to the mother more than the baby. Okay, same thing like nutrients, same thing like fluid. So, you know, there can be something that just, you know, it's not, I mean, again, 99.9% .9 of miscarriages, okay, have nothing to do, no fault of the parent. Um, sometimes, obviously, it is the fault of the parent, you know, they're using drugs, they're drinking alcohol, whatever, you know, but I mean, 99.9% .9 of the time, it has nothing to do that the mother did anything wrong. Um, so it just, it just happens that the environment is not the 100% that it needs to be for either fertilization to take place or for the, uh, I mean, again, you know, you, I mean, you all know most of the times, right? I mean, not every time a woman menstruates, does she actually get pregnant? So, you know, sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. It's just a matter of timing. It's a matter of the potency of the sperm. It's a matter of the, the um, uh, what's the right term for the egg, but the health of the egg. So, you know, so it's, uh, it's, you know, in some people, there's no problem whatsoever. Like somebody wrote every 12 months, they can get pregnant. Other people, it's it's a harder it's a harder journey. You know, it's not that anybody did anything wrong. It's just that's the way their their cells are, their body is, and stuff like that. Okay, so again, the ectopic pregnancy would mean that the sperm met at the egg in the fallopian tube like it should, but it, the egg did not continue to travel like it's supposed to, and it got lodged in here, and it continues to grow, and it could burst the um, the fallopian tube, and that running along the fallopian tube is the fallopian artery in vein, and will cause severe bleeding. Okay, so that's the issue there. Um, what else do we have? I think that's mostly what we would talk about. So this is talking about abnormal implantations and stuff like that, okay? So again, all you'd really like to see is that a, the um, placenta impregnate, uh, implants on the side, okay, and stuff. It is possible that it can implant on the side and still have problems, but it's very rare. But the ones that we mainly deal with would be if it implants 
on the top. Now you're saying, how could that happen? If the egg is coming like this and falls down, how can it happen? So again, you know, you don't know that egg got fertilized three days ago, right? You had, the, you know, you had sex, that woman had sex three days ago and that egg is still traveling through and now she's laying flat. Okay. When that egg actually flops into the, uh, the uterus. So it is possible that it can implant other places than here. I mean, obviously if she's standing upright when that egg travels, okay, it's going to go to the sides, but it is, it is theoretically possible because it does happen that it can implant up here. So what they're showing you is that it, because it implanted up here and because the woman's walking and moving and everything like that, the placenta can start to detach, right? Here it's nice flush up against the, the uterus. Now, growing between the placenta and the uterus is, you know, hundreds of blood vessels. And that's how the oxygen from the mother gets into the placenta, gets into the umbilical cord and goes into the baby. And that's how all the nutrients, the sugar and everything the baby needs, okay, gets from the mother's blood supply into the placenta through the umbilical cord to the baby. So here, what they're showing you is that it started to detach. It didn't 100% pull free, so the bleeding's confined to the center, but at some point it's gonna rupture free, and what's gonna happen is the mother and the baby can both bleed to death uh, very, very quickly that way. So that's called the bruptio placenta uh, down here. And then you have what's called placenta previa over here, where the egg actually implanted down low, and as the placenta grew, it covered the cervix, the opening from the uterus out into the vagina, so there's no way really to vaginally deliver that baby because the placenta is in, in the way. And I'll show you some different pictures because this is a complete blockage, but sometimes it implants down low where just the tip of it is touching. And as the uterus continues to grow, as the baby continues to grow and the uterus continues to stretch, it'll actually lift it up out of the way. So again, depending on the comfort level of the OBGYN, they may take a shot at you know vaginally delivering it. Um, you know, and then they'll be ready to do an emergency C-section, but they may take a shot. It depends on the, you know, the comfort level of the OBGYN. Again, in the, in the Jewish world, because they're used to dealing with women who have all these issues, most of the OBGYNs are very aggressive and they, you know, they take risks that if you went to, uh, I don't know, you know, uh, someplace where there's not a large, you know, Jewish population, um, they would think, think it's crazy. They would say, no, that has to be C-section. There's no doubt about it. Um, so it's, again, it's just a, you know, you service a certain clientele time and time and time and time again. Um, you know, um, you get used to doing that. Somebody wrote, can't you deliver the placenta first? No, because the placenta is continuing to provide the baby with oxygen during the delivery. So you can't, if the placenta detaches, the baby's immediately deprived of oxygen. And again, remember the umbilical cord is still attached to the placenta. So if the placenta detaches, the baby's gonna bleed out through the umbilical cord into the placenta. So the placenta is the last thing that's delivered, typically 20 minutes after the baby is delivered. So having a placenta detach early is a disaster, usually resulting in the death of the baby and the death of the mother if it happens in the field, right? If it happens in the delivery room, it'll probably um, may just result in the death of the baby, not the death of the mother, but um, it's a disaster. You never want the placenta you know, to detach or have any problems or anything like that. Okay, um, what time is it? 10, 11. So let's go a couple more minutes and then we'll, uh, then we'll call it a night. So, um, you know, not, uh, pregnancy is about 40 weeks, okay? Um, a normal full-term pregnancy is about 38 to 40 weeks. We typically say nine months, okay? But it's really about, you know, 38 to 40 weeks is a full pregnancy. The pregnancy is divided into three um, trimesters or three sections, okay? And uh, when we do the emergencies, we're gonna talk about emergencies in the first trimester and emergencies in the last trimester. There's not a lot of things, believe it or not, that happen in the second trimester. Most of the emergencies either happen early, okay, or happen late. Again, the placenta is the organ that develops, that it comes, it's actually the only organ you develop or a woman develops or a person, a human develops, and that when it serves its purpose is expelled from the body. But the placenta is the organ that grows. Again, it comes from the egg and it's the organ that grows um, to provide a connection between the mother's blood supply and the baby. So it grows into the wall of the uterus. It grows blood vessels to connect into the mother's circulation. And it's what brings oxygen because obviously the baby is not breathing when it's floating in a sack full of fluid. So it brings oxygen to the baby and the nutrients to the baby, okay? And it actually cleanses 
um, you know, it, it basically the, the waste products of the baby are transmitted through the placenta into the mother's blood vessels to be cleaned. So, you know, being pregnant is basically a huge stressor on the mother because now the mother is kind of, I don't want to say eating and doing everything for two, but definitely doing it for like, a, you know, a, an additional half person, so to speak. Um, so, you know, it's a, it's a big stressor. Remember, pregnancy was often the cause of death uh, for women probably until the uh, 1920s, 1930s, um, you know, and stuff like that. So it was, you know, it's, it's not, it's only really in the last 50, 60 years where pregnancy is not considered, um, you know, to be a, a risk, you know, to the woman to the extent that, uh, you know, it wasn't uncommon for women in, in, in childbirth to die. Okay, so again, the placenta is the connection and it's going to give the mother the oxygen it needs. It's gonna remove the carbon dioxide from the baby and the nutrients to the baby and the waste products away from the baby and so on, okay? The umbilical cord is the connection between the placenta and the baby. And the, the umbilical cord connects into the baby at the umbilicus, which is your belly button, okay? And the umbilical cord is actually pretty tough um, you'll be surprised when the day comes that you actually have to cut it with a scalpel, right? A scalpel is very sharp and you're going to think you're going to slice right through it. And it actually, you're almost doing a sawing um, motion to, uh, to get it to cut. So it's quite tough. It has uh, three blood vessels. It has two arteries and one vein. And actually the circulation in the umbilical cord is similar to the pulmonary circulation where the vein has the oxygen and the arteries don't have the oxygen. So it's the only other set of blood vessels where it's the opposite of normal circulation that the artery is low in oxygen and the vein is high in oxygen or the veins are high in oxygen because there's two. Uh, but they don't ask that on the test. Okay, so again, the uh, umbilical cord is the connection and obviously to get the baby uh, away from the placenta after we deliver the baby, we have to clamp the umbilical cord in two places and cut it uh, between it. So the reason we have to clamp it in two places is that you don't want the placenta to bleed and then the mother will bleed out through the placenta and you don't want the baby to bleed. So you have to clamp it on both sides and then you cut between it. Um, the baby grows in a fairly tough sac called the amniotic sac and it is floating in amniotic fluid inside that sac and it basically is kind of like a protection for the baby. Um, and while it's in the amniotic sac, it is not breathing. And I'll talk to you about how oxygen, um, well, I'll talk to you now. So basically um, what happens is that the umbilical cord, right, is bringing the oxygenated blood into the baby. And when the blood circulates to the heart, normally in us, it's right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary veins to the lungs, you know, give up carbon dioxide, get oxygen, then pulmonary artery, um, I'm sorry, it's, uh, it's um, sorry, it's a uh, right ventricle into the pulmonary artery to the lungs, right? And it gives up the, car the low oxygen, gets fresh oxygen, it goes pulmonary vein to the left atrium and then left ventricle pumps to the body. Since you, a baby doesn't need the blood to go to the lungs because it's not breathing, it's floating in fluid, right? It's not breathing. What happens is that we had a hole between our right atrium and right ventricle. And that when the blood came into the right atrium, when we were a tiny little baby in our mother's belly, it actually went from your right atrium right to your right ventricle. And it didn't go to your lungs because it has no need to go to your lungs. And then from your, from your left atrium, it went to your left ventricle and it pumped to your aorta. But again, it was oxygenated blood because it's getting the oxygen from the mother and it doesn't need to go through our lungs. So while the mother is floating in the amniotic sac, it's actually has that amniotic fluid going in and out of its mouth, its stomach, its nose, its lungs. So their lungs are actually filled um, with amniotic fluid. Now you say, well, then how does the baby survive? So when they're delivered, especially in a vaginal delivery and they're squeezed out through the uterus and the, and the vagina, okay, a lot of that fluid is squeezed out of the baby, out of the baby and actually some of it is squeezed out of the lungs into the tissue around the lungs. But the long and short is the process of a vaginal delivery basically rids the baby of that fluid. And then the first couple of cries it takes are the actual highest pressures that you're ever experiencing your lungs because those first couple of breaths or cries that a baby takes are what inflates the lungs and pushes the extra fluid out of the lungs. So a baby is born by C-section actually needs usually a little working on to get it to do everything it needs to do because it did not have the benefit of the vaginal delivery, okay? 
So again, the amniotic fluid is the fluid inside the amniotic sac that the baby is floating in and actually inhaling and, and you know, ingesting and stuff like that. Um, so this is basically showing you kind of like the, uh, you know, the, um, what the reproductive system kind of looks like. Um, the, so this is the front of the mom, right? So you're in the belly buttons over here. Um, down low, there's a little bone called your pubic bone or and a woman called her pubic bone. And this is the obstacle to the baby actually being delivered. So sometimes when we're going to deliver a baby, right, it's going to come down into through the cervix, which is the opening of the uterus, and it's going to come down into the vagina and it's going to get stuck. And that just means that the baby is too large. Typically, it's the shoulder gets stuck on the pubic bone. Again, this all expands so it could come through. And sometimes you actually have to reach up and take that more anterior shoulder and just guide it downward under the pubic bone to actually get it to come out. Okay. And I'll, I'll best as I can show you pictures and kind of describe it and stuff like that to you. Um, what else? Um, this is showing you the placenta, right? It's attached right up on the side over here. Again, the umbilical cord is to the baby. So this is what we call a cephalic delivery, which means head first. And that is really the only way a baby is, can be delivered. Um, if you have a breach, there can be a breach where it's butt first, or there can be a breach where it's legs first. Um, those are very difficult to vaginally deliver in the field. There can be a limb presentation, which means that an arm or leg is sticking out. And that's what you see. Those cannot be delivered in the field. Uh, those are emergencies that need to be transported to the hospital. And usually those babies wind up to be C-sectioned or they can try to, if it's an arm, insert it back up or a leg. But a lot of times they actually wind up breaking the arm or breaking the, um, the shoulder when they try to put it back up there. So we don't do that in the field. Um, we just rush them to the hospital. Um, what else? Because of all the pressure when a baby is delivered, it is not uncommon for a woman to have a bowel movement. She doesn't know she's having it or it's not uncommon for a woman to urinate because it's pushing on the bladder as it's going down. So she doesn't know that she's actually even doing it, but uh, it's not uncommon for that to happen and stuff. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, you just have to cleanliness wise, just try to keep the baby out of all the mess and stuff like that. Now, somebody asked when you say she is open one to 10. Okay. So when they're saying the degree of dilation of the cervix is, I guess what you're saying. So they give two numbers. They give dilation, which means, you know, is opening, okay, how wide the cervix is. And there's also what they call effacement, which is how thin the area is. So you need the cervix to become dilated, which means the muscle relaxes and the opening opens, and to efface, which means it becomes thinner. Um, and both of those things have to happen for a baby to vaginally deliver. So 10 would be the most. So like if you, you know, walked in and they said, oh, this is going to be a long haul, because you know you're one and one, it means that you're, the woman is just early in her pregnancy and the cervix is not relaxed. There is medicine they could give, Cervidil and different stuff they can give to help the muscle to start to relax. Um, but again, if it's an otherwise healthy baby that's not anywhere near term, they're not going to speed up the delivery. You know, they're just going to let it run its natural course. And sometimes they'll actually tell you to go home. You know, you'll go in and uh, you know they'll say, you know, you're way early. You know, you got another, you know, two days before this is going to happen. So better to be home than be sitting in a hospital, especially now with COVID, um, and they'll just tell you to go home, okay? And then sometimes what happens to us, you know, EMS-wise is that, you know, I tell her to go home, so the woman's embarrassed to call again and just to be told that she's in early labor, so she waits and waits and waits, and then all of a sudden, you know, it's time, and, you know, we get called because they don't have time to drive to the hospital, and we wind up delivering the baby, you know, in the ambulance or something like that, so um, I'm sure probably more, if you combine, say, KJ, and New Square and maybe Vizhnitz and Satmar, I'm sure more babies are delivered in the back of ambulances. If you combined all the Hasidish uh, Hatsola ambulances, then probably every, every other ambulance combined in New York State, um, you know, routinely. It's just, it's, you know, I mean, before I moved to Rockland County, I delivered one baby. So, you know, it's just not very common, you know, to deliver babies um, outside of the, uh, you know, the Jewish population. Okay, so what happens physiologically during pregnancy in a woman? And then we'll, you know, we'll pretty much call it a night. I think we got a couple. Yeah, we'll stop uh, right about, think about here. So we got four more slides. So what happens physiologically, right? And anatomically means the shape. Physiologically means what's happening, you know, um, 
well, I keep on saying physiologically, but what's happening with the function. So because of the different hormones that are secreted into the woman's bloodstream, certain things happen to different systems. Okay, so cardiovascularly, the woman actually develops more blood volume. Why? Because she has to now pump blood to the placenta, right? So she has to have more blood. Her cardiac output increases, which is the amount of blood that's pumped by the heart in one minute. Again, because she now is servicing not only herself, okay, but the baby, right? And also her heart rate increases because one of the ways that you can increase your cardiac output is by increasing your heart rate because the two components of cardiac output, I know this was a long time ago, but it was heart rate times stroke volume, right? So stroke volume is the amount of blood that's pumped out of the left ventricle at one contraction and heart rate is how many times a minute. So your cardiac output is a measurement of how much blood is pumped out of the heart in one minute. So that's made up of what your heart rate was for one minute and how much blood comes out of the ventricle each time your heart contracts. Okay, so long and short is that your cardiovascular system has to work harder and has to have more blood because now you have the baby. Your respiratory system, very interestingly, same thing happens, but what also happens is that those hormones actually cause bronchodilation. So why do we wanna have bronchodilation? Because picture this poor woman who's got a 10 pound baby in her belly with the, with the pressing up on her diaphragm. It becomes much more difficult for her to breathe. So by having some bronchodilation, her airway passageways are open more and it's easier for her to breathe, okay? Um, gastrointestinally, so there's, you know, obviously in the first trimester, because of the hormones, there's definitely an increase in nausea and vomiting. And there's actually uh, some women that actually have to be hospitalized. They have what they call hyper, which means a lot, emesis, which is vomiting. And they actually vomit so forcefully and so much that they, you know, they get the, they can actually get dehydrated. And there's even cases where they've lost a the baby by the force of the vomiting. Nowadays, there's medicines they can give them to control it. But, you know, years ago, it was a much bigger emergency. And the peristalsis, the moving of the food through the digestive tract is slowed because the baby is pressing on everything. So you have to assume that a woman always has a full belly as far as the risk of vomiting and aspiration, because where it may take us two or three hours to move food through our gastrointestinal tract, it's gonna take a woman all day because everything's being pushed on during the third trimester because the baby's so large and stuff like that. Again, the extra weight of the baby uh, facing forward makes them more likely to fall, balances off. They have more issues with back pain and stuff like that, okay? And it can exacerbate or worsen pre-existing medical conditions in a woman. So in other words, if she's an asthmatic, again, now she's breathing for two, plus the baby's making it more difficult to breathe. So it definitely can add stress, especially in women who go into the pregnancy not healthy, overweight and not healthy and stuff like that. Um, they're even, you know, are diabetic women. So you have women who are pre, uh, who are pre-diagnosed, or I mean, I'm sorry, not pre-diagnosed, but are already known diabetics. So now you have issues again with controlling blood sugar. You have issues because the baby is growing in a high sugar environment that it tends to grow very large. So it's hard to vaginally deliver them. And then you even have the situation where the woman is not a diabetic, but the stress of the pregnancy, she gets what's called gestational diabetes, which means diabetes brought on by pregnancy. Okay, and then once the baby's delivered, she typically comes back to normal. But statistically, they found that if the woman doesn't get back to her pre-pregnancy weight, so let's say prior to being pregnant, she weighs 110 pounds. During pregnancy, she goes up to 140, 150, because she, she develops that gestational diabetes. Okay, now she rids herself of the baby, her blood sugar stabilizes it. Okay, and um, if she doesn't get back to her pre-pregnancy weight within three months, she has a certain percentage chance of becoming a diabetic per, uh, permanently. So it's very important if, you know, your wives develop gestational diabetes, that you go out of your way to help them, you know, with weight control and getting their weight down, which is going to mean, you know, walking with them and encouraging them and stuff like that um, to get their weight back down. And remember, you know, now they have the added burden of another child. So it's definitely going to mean you're going to have to do more um, you know, with pitching in and stuff like that, um, with that, because there's a definitely a bigger risk of them developing permanent diabetes. Um, somebody says, which water breaks? So the water, when they say the water breaks is that the cervix, right? Which was the, uh, the cervix, which is down here in the cervix, there's what grows a called a mucus plug. So it's kind of the same mucus you have in your nose, um, but a, a plug, a cork develops in here. And that's what keeps the amniotic fluid, okay, um, 
well, I, sh I shouldn't say, because the amniotic fluid is in the amniotic sac, but that's what keeps everything contained up in here, doesn't allow it to travel out of the uterus until that, that ruptures. And typically when that ruptures, the amniotic sac ruptures and you get the amniotic fluid coming out. So the water, when they say their water broke, it means that the mucus plug ruptured and the amniotic sac ruptured. And typically that baby, once the water ruptures, the baby needs to be delivered, I would say comfortably within like say two to three hours because it becomes much harder to deliver a baby with a dry uh, amniotic sac, no fluid, and also the risk of infection increases. So usually they'll only give it a certain amount of time from when the sac ruptures before they want that baby out. If not, they're gonna do a C-section, okay? And somebody says, when does it break? It breaks when the contractions, when the, you know, the uterus starts to, the muscle starts to squeeze and they have the contractions. All contractions are is that the uterus again is a muscle. So as it comes time for that baby to deliver, the uterus starts to contract and starts driving the baby downward into the birth canal, into the vagina. Um, what else? Okay, so again, we talked about all this, but you know, obviously, you know, as far as posture and stuff like that, um, you know, when it's leaning forward, it's much easier for a woman to fall um, because she has all this weight out in front of her. Again, fundal height, talking about where the top of her belly is, because that's gonna be where the top of her uterus, the fundus is the top of the uterus. So when you see the fundal height kind of still up by the xiphoid process, she's probably not ready to deliver. If this, if this height was down here by her belly button, that means the baby's now shifted down towards the vagina and is getting ready to deliver. So that's much more likely. Now, in saying that, and I'm sure some of you have, some of, the, some of you have had this with your wives. There are some women that carry very low, okay? So in other words, even when they're not ready to deliver, they're not up here. They're just typically, you know, it's always lower. So you would just have to say, I always just ask them. And again, you're gonna have the problem that, you know, they're not gonna really want you to talk to them or, or ask them questions. But I always say to them, you know, does it seem like your belly's a little lower than it's been over the last couple of days? And just kind of get an idea of, you know, where it's been. If they say, no, it's always been there then it's probably not that the baby's engaged down into the birth canal and getting ready to deliver. Um, okay, so we'll talk about the last emergency and then, or, or uh, I guess a, pre, a pre-delivery emergency. So this is called supine, which means flat on your back, hypotensive, which means low blood pressure syndrome. So what they're talking about is that the woman is in her last trimester, the last three months of her pregnancy. The baby is large, okay? So the weight of the placenta, the baby and all the amniotic fluid can weigh upwards of 25 pounds, right? It's a lot of weight. Now, when they're laying flat on their back, what's it pressing towards? Their spine, right? And what's running along your spine is your aorta and your inferior vena cava. So your aorta is a high pressure vessel, so it's not very easy to compress it, but your inferior vena cava is a low pressure vessel because it's a vein. So what it actually does is it puts pressure on the inferior vena cava and lets less blood get back to the heart. So again, how does a pump work? A pump works that it can only pump out what gets into it. So if you're not getting the same amount of blood back to the heart, the cardiac output has to drop. So if the cardiac output drops, the blood pressure drops. So now all of a sudden, because they're laying flat, they start to get dizzy and weak and they feel like they're gonna pass out. And it's just because they're lying flat. Again, and you probably noticed this with your wives, you know, they don't typically lie flat for two reasons. Their legs go numb, their blood pressure drops, and um, they have trouble breathing because when you lie flat, it presses up on your diaphragm, right? The weight of the baby shifts up onto your diaphragm and it becomes harder for you to breathe. So that's all that is. It was a much bigger issue years ago, years ago when we put people on long boards. Um, you know, like a woman who's pregnant in a car accident, we used to drag them out, put them on a long board, tie them down. And then all of a sudden they'd be like, oh, I feel weak and dizzy. I feel like I'm going to vomit. I feel this. And that's what it really was. And the treatment is to basically put them on their side instead of flat on their back. Okay. So again, it's very rare. You're ever going to have to the legs. No, no, that doesn't really help because remember it's the weight of the belly pressing down by lifting up their legs. You're actually probably putting more pressure. So what you need to do is shift the weight off their spine. And the way you do that is you can put them on their side. Okay. And uh, that will do it. Again, it's not that common. And again, we don't really ever trans transport women anymore um, flat on their back. So it's not really an issue. Okay. So last thing is, not the last thing. I mean, I think we have quite a few. Uh, we're on uh, 
slide 19 of 111. So we got a lot ahead of us. But I just said here, what does the development of the fetus, you know, how does the development of the fetus affect other body systems? So obviously, you know, it's just an, another draw, another um, burden on all the other systems of a woman's body, right? Now, certain things happen to help it. In other words, the, the relaxation of the bronchioles makes it easier to breathe. You know, the increase in the blood volume makes it easier to um, keep the patient's, uh, the woman's blood pressure up and stuff like that. Interestingly, all the blood that a woman gains in pregnancy, right? So let's say she gains, I don't know, 500 mLs of blood, right? So when she actually has the baby, she loses that blood so that she gains it while she needs it. And then once she delivers the baby, right with the process of delivering, blood comes out. And, you know, when the placenta delivers, there's usually a gush of blood and that's that extra blood, almost the exact equivalent of the extra blood that she gained um, for the pregnancy. So it's, you know, when they say, you know, the miracle of birth, the miracle of life, all this stuff, I mean, it is pretty amazing. Um, when you think about, you know, everything that has to happen to have a baby and everything that has to happen to deliver a baby and that everything pretty much goes back to normal fairly quickly. The other thing that I always found really amazing, if you ever, you know, think about it deeply is eating food and that it actually travels through the, you know, these, I don't know, probably 30, 40 feet of tubes, not getting stuck. And, uh, you know, you get everything you need to stay alive out of it and everything works perfectly. So that's probably why there's the bracha you know, that you, you say after you go to the bathroom, um, because it really truly is a miracle um, that everything works, you know, for whatever you're, you know, for your 120 years with, uh, you know, for the most part with no, no issues. Anyway, um, I digress from what we should be talking about. Um, I'm done. So it's, uh, it's already a little late, but uh, it's 1030. So does anybody have any questions on anything we went over so far tonight? Okay. So we're going to call it a night. Um, tomorrow night, we'll pick up with the rest of OBGYN. And then Matzah Shabbos, um, we'll either finish up anything we didn't finish up tonight. And then I also want to just talk about the spinal injuries um, because you guys wanted to go over that lecture. And um, what else? Somebody says we have gone the other night till 11. So you want to be the guy that tells everybody we have to stay on till 11, plus I'm falling asleep. So um, no, tonight we're not staying on till 11. I want to be in bed by 11, but uh, we'll finish up tomorrow night. And then what we don't finish up, we'll, you know, we'll touch upon on Saturday night or something like that. But I think we'll be able to finish tomorrow night. And um, again, we'll, um, we'll meet Saturday night for those of you that can participate and we'll just review the spinal injuries and the uh, stuff. And then um, we really don't have much left after that. I think we have peds and geriatrics and then a little bit about uh you know, mass casualty incidents and stuff like that. And then we're going to basically be in review. So um, I guess it's good that we'll have that little extra week because that will definitely make it easier um, as far as squeezing time into review and stuff like that. Okay, so any questions going once? Everybody's good? Okay. Um, all the videos are on Dropbox. Yes, they should all be on Dropbox. I know I've been tired at night and I've been screwing up putting the previous nights on and stuff like that, but uh, people have been texting me pretty quickly and I try to correct it the next morning, but all the videos are on Dropbox and all the videos are on YouTube. Um, the only videos that are not on YouTube are a couple of the um, review ones where we were actually going over questions because I didn't want that on YouTube where everybody can see it. So those couple, I think there were two Saturday nights where that's only on Dropbox. Okay. Um, okay. Any other questions? Okay. So everybody have a good night and uh, we'll pick up again eight o'clock tomorrow, uh, tomorrow night. Good night. Good night.